the Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, everyone. We welcome everyone who is attending the public hearing in the Royal Commission Brisbane hearing room, as well as those following the proceedings on the live stream. This is the third and last day of public hearing 33 of the Royal Commission. I will now invite Commissioner Mason to do the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. We acknowledge Maiden Brisbane. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both Turrbal and Jagera nations. We acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera nations as the traditional custodians and owners of the lands upon which this Royal Commission is sitting. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present, and we acknowledge First Nations young people who one day will take their place as elders. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their enduring connection to land, sky, seas and waterways. We pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today and who are following this public hearing online on the mainland and on the islands, including Tasmania and in the Torres Strait, especially elders, parents and young people with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Before I hand over to Council Assisting Ms Eastman, I would like to remind those viewing this hearing that there are non-publication and pseudonym directions which apply to certain evidence. The two young men who are the focus of this hearing are referred to by pseudonym Caleb and Jonathan. The Royal Commission has made directions prohibiting the publication of their names and identifying information in relation to this hearing. Ms Eastman. Thank you, Commissioner McEwen, and good morning, Commissioners, and good morning to everybody in the room and those following what will be the final day of the Royal Commission's substantive hearings. Uh, could I also remind people following today's hearing that there will be content that people may find distressing, triggering, upsetting, or cause them worry and concern. And uh, the numbers that came up on the screen with our content warning earlier this week continue to be available to people if they require any assistance and support. And we also have members of our counselling team present here at the Royal Commission today. Commissioners, today we've turned our attention to six witnesses representing various Queensland departments and agencies who over the course of a period of around 20 years interacted with Caleb, Jonathan and their father. Each bring slightly different perspectives to the nature and the extent of their interaction with the family, but all played a material and important role in providing safety and welfare and well-being to the lives of Caleb and Jonathan. In terms of the organisation of the day, we thank everybody for starting early and bearing with us with the early start. The plan at this stage uh, would be to take the first two witnesses and then adjourn for morning tea. Following morning tea, there'll be a further witness and towards the end of that witness's evidence, Commissioners, there will be a part of his evidence which will be taken in a closed session. There's some material that we need to show the witness in the hearing room that is part of the confidential material. And so we will be kindly asking those people who are not representing a party with leave to appear or otherwise staff of the Royal Commission to vacate the hearing and that there'll be a period of time where they may have a longer lunch than us, but that we will uh, take that evidence in a closed session. And then following lunch, there, I think, will be the remaining three witnesses. All being well, Commissioners, we hope to conclude sometime around 3.30 this afternoon. But um, often my estimates of time uh, are not always the most accurate, but we've uh, prepared on the basis that we'll do that. 
So our first witness is Dr Megan Crawford. You can see she's here with us in the hearing room and I understand you'll take an affirmation. Thank you, Dr Crawford. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Eastman. Dr Crawford, thank you for coming and to providing your forthcoming evidence and also for the material that you've provided to us. I'm Commissioner McEwen, Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. I will ask the associate, which is down here, to, on to your right, to uh, read out, to administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Ms Eastman will ask you some questions. Thank you, Thank you um, Dr Crawford, and welcome back. Uh, you, you appeared at the Royal Commission's hearing in Brisbane in public hearing eight a couple I of years ago. Is I that did, right? yes. So you've provided to the Royal Commission a statement. Have you got a copy of the statement yes, with you? Yes, I do. And the statement was made, I think, on the 5th of May. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And have you had an opportunity to read over the statement? Yes. And the contents of the statement are true and correct? Yes. Now, last time uh, you appeared, you uh, were representing the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs. Yes. Do you mind, for convenience sake, if I refer to the department by its old name, Child Safety? Certainly. So if I refer to Child Safety, I'm referring to the department, but I mean no disrespect in terms of the current name of the department. <coughs> Your substantive role in the department is Chief Practitioner, is that right? That's right. And in terms of your history with the department, it goes back to uh, a period of time in 2005, is that right? Yes, that's and right. So you've had a period employed by Griffith University as a researcher and then you came back to the department in 2011, is that right? That's right. But I did start with the department in 1991. Right. So, uh, if you've got a copy of your statement there, mm -hmm. uh, I want to start with some of the matters that you've identified in what you've described as background. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, do you recall at public hearing eight some evidence given by uh, Professor Daryl Higgins? Um, I know Daryl Higgins. I'm not aware of the evidence that he provided. You don't recall the evidence that he gave at that time? No, I don't. Right. Dr Higgins uh, and Commissioners, the Higgins evidence, if you need a reference, is Exhibit 8007. Professor Higgins on that occasion talked about the model of child protection adopted in Australia's states and territories as focused on something described as tertiary child protection. You've mm -hmm. heard that expression, yes, haven't I you? Have. And that the uh, orientation of child protection systems towards tertiary responses means that they are oriented towards assessing risk to children reported to a child safety agency, mm -hmm. often via mandatory reporting obligations mm -hmm. and managing identified risks of harm. Mm -hmm. So that's what he said. Do you agree with that characterisation? Yes. And this orientation is reactive. Reactive. Reactive in the sense, would you agree, that if the tertiary approach is responding to incidents or matters reported, mm. then the approach is one dependent on responding or reacting to those reports? Yes, it, we do respond um, and we do have a legislative definition um, for child protection notifications. So there are a number of different ways that we can respond to um, concerns that are presented to us. So we might record an intake inquiry, which is a general inquiry. We, we might record a child concern report, which means that there is some yeah. harm identified for the child, but we do not believe that that's at a significant harm level. Uh, I want to come back to that definition of harm Certainly. in a moment. But just really setting the scene, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, do you agree with me that the model is one 
that primarily works to reaction. It's reacting to events reported to it. We respond to significant harm and a reasonable suspicion that children are in need of protection. And Dr Higgins expressed the view to the Royal Commission that he was not aware of any systemically funded, evidence-based child mal maltreatment prevention and early intervention programs and services that are widely accessible to the majority of families. Uh, do you uh, have any knowledge of whether there are systemically funded, evidence-based child maltreatment prevention and early intervention programs available to families? There is a difficulty in the evidence base for programs. Um, the Queensland Government certainly funds a number of uh, secondary services, so um, prevention or secondary supports, which should assist families and divert some from the tertiary child protection system. All right. I want to take you now to paragraph five of your statement. Yes. And uh, can I uh, ask you this? You've been careful in your language in that, that paragraph, haven't you? Uh, You've carefully thought what you wanted to include yeah. in that paragraph? Yes. And you wanted to emphasise that the department acknowledges that on occasions over a 20-year history with the family, practitioners could be perceived as overestimating mm -hmm. the father's capacity to mitigate risks present and provide for his children's yes. needs. So you've thought carefully about using the language could be perceived, is that yes. right? Yes, I have. Um, you've had an opportunity to read the proposed agreed statement of facts. Yes, I have. You've also had the opportunity to review the department's records, is that right? I have, yes. Would you agree with me that using the expression could be perceived seeks to minimise or diminish the impacts in which the practitioners overestimated the father's capacity to mitigate the risks present? No. Are you uh, suggesting by the word perceived that uh, the practitioner's conduct can be explained away based on perception? I think when I reviewed the file, I could see some very rigorous assessments of this father and the impacts um, on the children. And I could see that there were periods of time where we intervened um, actively with him, where we referred to other services and where we did see improvements for the family over time. I undertake a number of reviews for the department. And I just I want to concentrate on on what you've put in paragraph five and why you've chosen to say it could be perceived rather than stating directly that the practitioners did in fact overestimate the father's capacity to mitigate risks present and provide for his children. Because it is the fact, isn't it? I'm always conscious of hindsight bias and the, the privilege of being able to look back at information. And um, I always feel for our staff in the moment. So. Well, let me preface my questions by saying I am not asking the Royal Commission to make any adverse findings mm -hmm. against any particular child safety officer Thank you. on a given day. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that as Thank an you. agreement. Thank you. But this Royal Commission is looking at, in this case study, at a life course approach mm -hmm. to understand why and how violence, abuse, neglect and the deprivation of two children with disability and their life course. So that's a context in which I'm asking you the questions. Yes. So in that context, if we do take the opportunity of reflecting back, mm. looking at the particular incidents, looking at the records, you'd agree that that provides an opportunity to learn yes. what the patterns were, yes. what the life course influences were, where there are gaps, <clears throat> you agree? Yes. Whether the model is one, essentially based on reaction rather than prevention. Mm -hmm. We have the opportunity to do that, don't we, by reflecting back? Yes, we do. And you'd agree with me reflecting back to suggest that it could be no higher than it could be perceived as overestimating the father's capacity to mitigate risks and, prevent, and provide for his children's need. That seeks to minimise the, the, the collective evidence available. Would you agree with that? No. 
you've included in your uh, evidence in paragraph six and following some references to Dr. Andrew Whitaker's work. Yes. And I think you've now got a copy of the two articles that are referred to in footnote one and footnote two of your statement. Mm -hmm. The first one is uh, an article that was published based on Dr. Whitaker's evidence to a coronial inquiry here in Queensland. Do you agree with that? Yes, that's right. And you've read the uh, report? Yes, I have. And tell me if you disagree with any of the summaries that I want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, just with the time available, I'm not going to walk you through the detail of the sure. Whitaker report. But essentially, what he uh, said in his evidence to the coronial hearing is that child protection and child safety officers can offer, often operate with a level of what is described as unconscious bias. Yes. And the nature of unconscious bias reflects, and it's a term, but it reflects those thought patterns that are often instinctive or reactive. Mm -hmm. And understanding unconscious bias is to understand that the way in which we sometimes approach situations is... I'll use the uh, way in which Professor Danny Kahneman describes it, if mm -hmm. that's helpful, mm -hmm. is that our brains often work on what is often called fast and slow thinking. Yes. Fast thinking is the immediate responsive, immediate conclusions that mm -hmm. we make without taking the time to slow our thinking down mm -hmm. and go through the logical process of assessing evidence and taking the slow steps forward. Yes. If I can illustrate it this way, commissioners, um, and this is how Professor Kahneman describes the approach to unconscious bias, is if we ask people in the room what the answer to two plus two is, we don't really have to think about that. We know the answer. But if I ask people in the room, with the exception of those mathematicians and those with a calculator, what 2033 multiplied by eight might be, we can all do that exercise, but it requires a slower form of thinking. Yes. So uh, we would take the slow thinking to step through the processes to reach the answer. So unconscious bias reflects the mode of thinking which is reactive and it's often based on the way in which we use in our cultures, in our behaviours, in our language and in our patterns, mm. things that we're used to. Mm. Dr. Whitaker, in his report, talks about the unconscious bias for child safety officers looking always to be optimistic and to hope for the best. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. And he says that that can result in an unconscious bias where the child safety officers predominantly focus on the positive, mm -hmm. that they may seek to uh, overestimate or overweigh the evidence of a parent who might express love for a child, mm -hmm. a parent who might be professing to do their best, mm -hmm. and if a parent makes some improvement, then a lot of weight may be given to the outcome of the improvement, and the consequence might be in the way the unconscious bias operates is to minimise the negative or, or dangerous mm -hmm. factors. You agree with that? I'm really summarising, so bear with yeah. me if you think yes. any Ms. part of that summary is not accurate. Ms Eastman, we do train our staff in these biases because we are conscious. Um, so the, the professor that uh, you quoted and the, the thinking fast, thinking slow mm -hmm. is part of the training that we provide to child safety officers. And one of the reasons we um, have a supervision policy and employ more experienced uh, practitioners as team leaders is so that child safety officers can reflect on their practice, can reflect on their assessments um, and can be challenged about their thinking um, by a more experienced officer. Did the uh, initiatives in relation to addressing unconscious bias in training come in in recent times? I couldn't tell you the exact date. Well, let no. me put it this way. It didn't exist in 2000, no. did it? It didn't not exist in, in 2010? Probably not. And it probably didn't exist in 2019? 
Uh, yes, it would have existed. It would have had it by then, yes. But you can't remember exactly when. No, but I could get that for you. Right. And uh, Dr Whitaker made a number of recommendations as part of his evidence to the coronial inquiry. Mm. Did the Department of Child Safety Act on any of those particular recommendations? All, all of them, yes. And would that have informed any work child safety now does to address unconscious bias? Yes. And you haven't referred to any training on unconscious bias in this statement, mm. have you? No, I haven't. And you haven't addressed whether the department had reacted or responded to any of Dr Whitaker's uh, recommendations. you agree with that? I agree. When we're talking about unconscious bias in relation to the relationship between parent and child in a um, child protection setting, mm. uh, to what extent does the unconscious bias attaching to people with disability and particularly intellectual disability arise? Sorry, could you repeat that question? So un we've talked about unconscious yes. bias in the broader context of the relationship between parent yep. and child in a child protection setting. Yes. I'm asking you about the extent to which unconscious bias with respect to children with disability and in particular intellectual disability mm. arises. The thing about bias is that it's very individual. So to be able to um, say to what level across the agency, I'm not sure that I could describe that as such. It's certainly something we are conscious of for individual practitioners. Can I ask you to have a look at your paragraph 17? Yes. And just quickly read that to yourself. Have you yes. had a chance to read that? Yes. Do you accept reflecting on paragraph 17 that what you've said in that paragraph is laden with unconscious bias and assumptions about young people who you've described as nonverbal? Uh, what I do know about the case is that we went No, to no, I'm not asking about the case. I'm asking about what you've written here. And I'm asking you about whether or not you gr agree it is laden with unconscious bias about a young person with disability who you describe as non-verbal? No, I don't think it is, Leighton. Do you accept um, that what you've said in paragraph 17 with respect to excusing, if I can put that to you, the uh, lack of communication with Caleb and Jonathan on the basis that they were non-verbal is reflective of an unconscious bias in the way in which children who are non-verbal can express their wishes, their concerns or their grievances? No. I object to the question. Is that about... Three questions in one. So if my learned friend could break it up. You've answered the question. Mm. I, what I say in... What I say can in... I just ask you this question? Yes. Is that... Do you agree looking at the totality of the agreed facts and the extent you're familiar with the underlying documents that there is no evidence of a child safety officer first developing a plan to communicate with Caleb or mm -hmm. Jonathan mm -hmm. and secondly, any evidence recording any attempt to engage with Caleb or Jonathan privately away from their father, to mm. ask them about what was happening in their life. Would you agree with that? I would agree. And do you agree that the absence of any plan or any attempt to talk to these two young people mm. over the course of the 20 years is a deficiency in the way in which the child safety officers are engaged with this family? From my reading, there were attempts to engage with the young people. They were certainly visited um, both at home and at school. Um, so there was engagement with them. Um, there were observations of them and there was engagement with their teachers um, and other um, workers who provided support with them in order to gather information about their safety and well-being. Well, it's one thing to watch them, observe them, mm. but it's another thing to have direct communication mm. and communication in a manner that's appropriate to 
their level of language, their level of mm. comprehension and their level of engagement. Yes. Do you agree with me, reflecting on all of the material, mm. that throughout child safety's engagement with this family mm. is that the bias was always towards the information provided by the father or other people such as in the Department of Education, teachers who worked with the two young people? There was definitely a focus to the information and um, our workers must look at the impacts for children. So those observations, those visits, um, the coordination of supports um, all contributes to the assessment. And um, what do you say should have happened if uh, there should have been communication with the two young people? What should have happened in terms of communication with them? We should have sought information, particularly from the school, who were very skilled uh, in working with the children, about um, what communication was possible with them, what um, methods uh, were possible to use. So that and why happened. didn't that happen? I don't know. I don't know. I want to bring you now to paragraph nine of your statement yes. and to tell the Royal Commission that the department's involvement with the family span, spans almost a 20-year period and during that time the department's practice was guided by the Child Protection Act. That's right. So the Child Protection Act sets out the department's uh, functions, powers, and it also describes and defines particular terms that set, in effect, the parameters of what the department can do. Mm. As you've said in the statement, fundamental to the departmental decision-making is the concept of a child who is in need of protection, and that is defined as a child who has, and you've got three elements to this, suffered significant harm, mm -hmm. so that focuses on an event or something that has occurred, is that right? That's right is suffering significant harm, so that brings it to present circumstances, mm -hmm. or is at an unacceptable risk of suffering significant harm? And that has a predictive future element to it. That we need to look at the probability of future harm in that regard. So that's first element. So harm is a, an overarching uh, concept, mm -hmm. and I'll come to the definition in a moment. Mm -hmm. The second element is does not have a parent able and willing to protect from harm. Mm. So this concept very much links to the identification of harm. You agree with that? Yes. It, it inherently requires the parent to understand what the harm is mm -hmm. for an assessment to be made as to whether the parent is able mm -hmm. and willing. That's so there's right. two elements to that, that what needs to be um, assessed. That's right. You've said in paragraph 9 of your statement that harm to the child is defined in section 9.1 of the Child Protection Act and you've described it as any detrimental effect of a significant nature on their physical, psychological or emotional well-being. That's right. And you've also referred to section 9.2. Now, I think we have, a sec we have section 9 of the CPA, which I've brought up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, you can see that. So this is taken from the current version of the CPA. Mm -hmm. When you have a look at that definition of harm, you've extracted in your paragraph 9 the language from section 9.1 and you've also focused on section 9.2, which is it doesn't matter how the harm's caused. What you haven't included in your section 9 is the additional elements in 9.3 about the way in which harm can be caused. That includes physical, psychological, emotional abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. So the language of neglect is an element of harm. Mm -hmm. And harm can be caused in 9.4 by a single act, omission or circumstance. But importantly in 4.B, a series or combination of acts, omissions or circumstances. So omissions is a, 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 a relevant concept to take into account. Looking at that definition, mm. um, if we wanted, if we're being lawyers, we seek out other definitions, mm. neglect is not defined anywhere in the Act. Yeah. 
you in your statement have included some articles uh, about the concept of cumulative neglect. So if I can take you to paragraph 29 of your statement. Yeah. Ms Eastman, do you mind if I just clarify um, why I made the distinction between harm and didn't include all of the elements of the section? Well, if you can listen to my questions, we may get to that. Okay. Um, but if you feel that uh, you need, after the questions I'm about to ask you, the opportunity to do that, let me know. Thank you. And I'm sorry, which um, paragraph? Paragraph 29. Mm -hmm. The, pa the document's not paginated, so I'd have to go by paragraph numbers. Yeah, thank you. So paragraph 29, you acknowledge that there was cons a considerable amount of departmental contact with the family, mm -hmm. and it is evident in this contact there were patterns of events and circumstances which indicated a cumulative impact on the safety and the well-being of young people. Yeah. And you say the assessment of cumulative harm is well recognised as a challenge for child protection practitioners. Yes. Now, the article that you've referred to, which I think you've got with you now, yes. you have quoted an extract from page seven of the Bryce and Others article. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. And um, I assume that you read this article carefully before deciding to include it in your statement and also to extract that passage there. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. This um, article reflects some research that was undertaken mm -hmm. to look at what the authors describe as a concept of cumulative harm, mm -hmm. which the authors say happens to be a largely Australian term. But you would agree reading through this article and the way in which cumulative harm is described mm -hmm. that, in effect, it is neglect and it is neglect over a period of time that could also be characterised as systemic neglect. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? Mm -hmm. And as you read through the article and the extracts of the evidence that are included, that the neglect that arises on a cumulative basis is a mixture of particular incidents, but it also includes omission, mm -hmm. and it also includes the cumulative effect of a series of acts and a series of omissions. Yes. And it also requires an understanding of the context in which the child's welfare or safety is at risk. Yes. That context is not just looking at the particular incident that occurs, but the context is to look at the safe, safety and protective mm. factors around the child yes. with the immediate family and then branching out to the community and then branching out to the government institutions that may have the power to intervene or react. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues raised in this article is the importance of understanding the family structure, mm -hmm. and particularly the issues around how parents may struggle. For example, if parents have intergenerational experience of trauma, if uh, parents have a hostility to engagement with government or other agencies and parents are reluctant to accept help and assistance and therefore that can have the impact of fostering, as they say, fear and hypervigilance. So would you agree that when you have um, described and used the expression cumulative harm, that in effect you are referring to a concept of neglect that's captured by subsection four in section nine of the Child Protection Act. We can bring that back up if you need it. Yes. And to the extent that in paragraph 29, uh, you refer to the cumulative impact on Caleb and Jonathan, mm. can we take by what you say in paragraph 29 as an admission that each of these two young men experienced neglect and indeed cumulative harm as a result of that neglect over their life course. Yes, and our investigation and assessment outcomes reveal that. We had substantiated outcomes, so that was recognised by departmental workers. And in terms of responding to neglect, if we look at the totality of the evidence, mm. 
for the most part, the responses were to the single act, omission or circumstance that may have been reported to child safety? Yes, and then the subsequent assessment information, so the information that was gathered through the assessment process. But it's difficult, would you agree, looking at the totality of the material to mm. see when and how the department consciously and without unconscious bias, mm. consciously did an assessment of whether the patterns of behaviours, the patterns of omissions mm. and the patterns of interactions within the immediate family and the broader family were very significant markers of a very significant risk of neglect to both Caleb and Jonathan. I hear what you're saying, Ms Eastman, and that is why at times we substantiate it at risk. So there was a recognition of the history of the passions of the cumulative nature for the boys, which was why we had outcomes that said sub-risk and why we intervened with them. Um, through a number of different um, mechanisms, such as the child protection order, such as the intervention with parental agreement. Um, and there were a couple of those. But you agree with me that those interventions were mm. primarily directed to a particular acute circumstance at the time and that none of the interventions uh, proactively addressed the neglect? I wouldn't agree with that. I think the... the very much the interventions were focused on neglect, particularly the neglect as seen through the household environment, the boys' hygiene, uh, the boys' diet. I think there were particular focus, that was a particular focus of the intervention and of the referrals that were made as well. Well, let me give you one example. This mm. is in the agreed facts at paragraph 286 to 288. And accepting for the relevant time frame, uh, it is Jonathan who is still a child. On the 10th of February 2019, child safety officers attended the home unannounced and did a safety assessment in response to a notification that had been received on the 9th of February. That notification, if it assists, is set out at paragraph 284. Mm and it's a health professional who would notify the Department of Child Safety of concerns expressed to them by a community member. So you've got a community member raising it with a health professional who in turn has raised it with yes. you. The health professional would have been a mandatory reporter by then. Yes. So uh, the response to that notification is for the child safety officers to do an unannounced uh, visit or attendance at the home mm -hmm. and the facts record that the, there was an interview with the father and an observation with Caleb and Jonathan. The records record this. During the visit, Caleb was not in the house and had gone outside. At the end of the visit, as the child safety officers <coughs> were leaving the home, Caleb was observed sitting in the overgrown grass at the front yard, eating a large raw dog bone, which the dog was observed to have been eating at the time mm. of child safety's mm. arrival. Mm. Now, accepting at this stage that Caleb was by then, I think, 18, and accepting that this is the circumstances in which he lived and that his younger brother lived in those same circumstances, mm -hmm. would not an observation of a young person eating dog or chewing on the dog bones mm. after the dogs had had the bones would have been something that we should have alerted the department to a risk in the immediate term but may also have required the department to do some more detailed investigation as to how and why circumstances like that could have ever have occurred. Do you yes. agree with that? Yes, and I, I also read that material. It's very distressing. I could see from the caseworkers' own notes that they were very concerned about the situation um, for both 
the boys, as you say, one being an adult at that time, recommending strongly a multi-agency response um, to the needs of both children um, and some follow-up that then occurred. So that was not a one-off visit. That was one visit as part of that um, investigation and assessment process. But at 290 of the agreed facts, the department considered that it was not legally mandated to intervene in relation to Caleb and that there needed to be ongoing discussions with the NDIS to ensure Caleb received the level of care he required. Mm. That rather suggests that uh, in the context of these two young people, that once they hit the magic age of 18, then child safety is out of their life. Is that right? I wouldn't... Well, we don't have a legal framework to intervene with adults. I think what this... Um, demonstrates is that there was concern for him, concern for his safety and well-being, and a recognition that there needed to be follow-up with adult services. So they certainly didn't think, oh, well, this is an adult, we're not going to intervene. They wanted to ensure that there was follow-up by the appropriate agencies. But our Act doesn't allow us to intervene uh, with adults. And so what other agencies were available then to intervene with respect to adults? So because clearly a concern is one thing, but yeah. action is something else. You'd absolutely. agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the NDIS was available um, in that location at that time. You know the NDIS is not a service provider itself, is it? No, but it, it funds particular agencies which can be contacted for support. And do you know there's no requirement to participate in the NDIS? Yes, and did your department make any inquiries of the NDIS as to whether or not Caleb had a service provider or was providing services in the home in 2019? Uh, I would need to take that on notice. Mm. Uh, as, I, as far as I'm aware, there was an NDIS package for him at that time, mm -hmm. um, but I would need to take the, that on notice. You didn't hear the evidence yesterday that no. with respect to his package of over $102,000 that in the first year of that package, the spend was $361 oh. on transport and continence products. That is Nothing shocking. else. That's shocking. If uh, child safety was aware of that information, what could child safety have done in those circumstances, either by way of referral to the police or oh. elsewhere? I'm not sure that a police referral would have been the option, but there would have been the follow-up with the support coordinator and uh, the NDIS, the agency who was providing um, much of the support under the agreed package. But it's not part of the NDIS's functions to address a circumstance like that, is it? Uh, we have a number of interjurisdictional governance bodies and contacts um, within the NDIA, which we can escalate matters to. Um, so that's an option to us if we're trying to navigate what services are uh, in place for a particular child or young person. All right. I want to take you uh, back to paragraph 29. And in terms of the quotes that you make about from the Bryce article mm. and you talk about cumulative harm this is towards the end of the page, resulting from neglect associated with poverty, substance abuse, poor mental health and inadequate housing. Would you agree, in effect, that describes this family? Yes. It is a family experiencing poverty, yes. substance abuse, poor mental health and inadequate housing. Well, it was a Department of Housing Commission house, so they did have some housing stability and it was that family only in that house. You've seen the photos of the conditions of the house, yes, haven't you? Yes, I have. You're not suggesting to the Royal Commission that that was adequate housing no, based I'm on those photos? That. What I'm saying is You're they, saying had, they had a house? Yes, I'm saying they had access to a Department of Housing home. But in terms of the uh, living conditions, mm. you'd agree that was not adequate? That was not adequate. Uh, I think you've said in your statement that there were 23 occasions where particular matters through notifications were brought to the department. Mm. Would you agree that a review of those 23 not notifications provided the department with ample evidence of the risk factors to, the, to Caleb and Jonathan with respect to harm as described in the mm. Child Protection Act? 
Yes, and there were matters that following investigation and assessment were substantiated and there was active intervention provided. And in terms of that element of having a parent who was able and willing mm. to address the harm, uh, would you agree that the department had ample knowledge about Paul Barrett's behaviours, the nature of his engagement with government authorities, mm. Uh, that would have squarely put the Department of Child Safety on notice that he was unwilling and unable to address the harm to either of his sons. Uh, it is why we took a child protection order in relation to the older child uh, and after some negotiation with him, um, he certainly expressed a strong commitment to improving the situation and that's when um, interventions like intervention with parental agreement were opened. But acknowledging that these were children in need of protection and in need of uh, intervention to improve their circumstances. What would have needed to have occurred for each or both of these two children when they were children mm -hmm. to be permanently removed from Paul Barrett? Mm -hmm. What would it have taken? We would have needed to have gone before a magistrate and um, identified that they were children in need of protection. As you will see through the principles of our Act, we do have an obligation to work with families and to support them. And even when we remove them, there is an obligation for us to work to increase safety and to, where possible, return them home. Um, I think a magistrate would have... Uh, said to us that you need to be intervening with him um, to improve safety. But you, but don't, was not you don't know that. You're that speculating was, on I'm that. I'm speculating. I'd but you never that. at any stage in, in, except for that first two years, took that step of approaching a magistrate to at least determine whether this was at a sufficiently high level of seriousness in terms of the harm occasion to these young people that no, they should right. be removed. So we did not test that. Um, what is of interest is that in 2010, after a period of intervention with parental agreement, there was noted improvement in the circumstances um, confirmed by the school who were seeing the children very regularly and then no notifications received for a four-year period, um, which may say something about notify behaviour and may say something about um, the father's ability to maintain change. But isn't that the very point uh, that we started with, is if the model is one of reaction and it requires mm. a notification, yes. then the absence of hearing something does not mean everything's fine, does it? Does it does not equal That's safety. That's the point of the unconscious yeah. bias, is and, it not? And it is why we had at times referred the family to Family and Child Connect so that they were linked to a secondary service provider, which as I explained earlier, is a family support option to try and divert from the tertiary child protection system. Uh, just in the time available, I want to turn to just a, a couple of questions about your response to the SCAN meeting. So yeah. as I said, your statement's not paginated and then the paragraph numbering changes. So if I could take you to paragraph 32. And then the next paragraph on the next page is one. Yes, apologies right, for So that. I've got to work with the page that we're on that starts with number one. Yes. And you've set out the circumstances of when and how a SCAN meeting occurs. Yes. It's the case, isn't it, that child safety le is the, the key agency or the leader? Yes, we're the lead agency for SCAN. And that the uh, purpose of a SCAN meeting is to ensure that there is a critical and comprehensive assessment of the risk of harm to a child? What it allows for is a coordination of information from a number of key agencies. So those key agencies include um, the Queensland Police Service, Department of Education, Department of Health, our agency. And um, as a result of a more recent coronial inquiry, we are now able to invite other critical partners like family support agencies. And you would expect that all of the members of the SCAN team would be very well aware of the risk of unconscious bias? I would expect so. And uh, the members of the SCAN team, people who've had particular training or experience with children and young people with disability? 
Uh, I would suggest so, but not necessarily. Does the SCAN meeting, to the extent it ever uh, is dealing with the circumstance of a young, a child or young person with disability, bring in a disability specialist into those meetings? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think it would be a good outcome. I also think mental health experts would be good from, from time to time as well. And at any of the SCAN meetings that you've referred to in your statement, was there ever uh, any uh, participation by a member who had particular expertise for children and young people with intellectual disability? Not that I'm aware of. Do you agree that the absence of that expertise in a meeting with the purpose that it has of SCAN was a deficiency? I think it would have it would have brought great value if that was available. If I uh, ask you to uh, reflect on, I think, the final SCAN meeting before the father's death, mm. it's agreed fact 272. This is a SCAN meeting of the 14th of January 2019. The child safety officer is recorded as thinking Paul Barrett was doing his, quote, absolute best and he loved, quote, Caleb and Jonathan. Would you agree with me that the father doing his absolute best and or a child safety officer reflecting a, the officer's view that the father loved his children is not the test required by Section 9 of the Act? I would agree. And do you agree that in some senses encapsulated in this one sentence is really the essence of why, may I put to you, child safety let both Caleb and Jonathan down? And that is because throughout the engagement with this family, excuses continue to be made because Paul Barrett was dealing with difficult children, dealing with kids with disability, doing his absolute best, mm and this misconceived view that he loved his children. I object to that question. It's a whole lot of propositions that the witness hasn't necessarily agreed with. Well, she has the opportunity to answer those propositions. Ms. Eastman, Ms. Eastman if we had unsubstantiated every outcome, then I think you're, you would have a point. But we did not. We substantiated, and we substantiated risk, and we opened intervention, and we made referrals because... We did understand the impacts for the children. We did understand that this father needed to increase his functioning and, in turn, improve safety for children. But that never happened, did it? Well, it did from time to time. Mm. Yes, it did. When you say it happened from time to time, you say that because there was an absence of notifications telling no, you otherwise. No, no, no. I say that because there were open periods of intervention with him. And, and noted improvements over time. So, no, I agree with you that the absence of, of reports does not equal safety. But what I see is the active intervention that occurred with this family from the department. Do you accept that the answer that you've just give, given diminishes an understanding of cumulative harm and the nature of systemic neglect? No, I don't think it diminishes because, as I you said before, accept. we were substantiating risk. Right, I want to ask you about paragraph 18, which is the disability practice kit. Yes. And uh, you've given us a date there of 2000, sorry, 2020, my apologies. Mm -hmm. When in 2020 was this published? Uh, it, it would have been toward the end of 2020. So we brought a new child safety practice manual um, in, in December 2019, and then we built those practice kits over that time. It was... Um, at a time when we were trying to build our internal capability regarding an understanding of disability and how we should assess and intervene. Um, and it was through a team that sits within the office of the chief practitioner. Was the practice kit co-designed with people with disability? No, it was not. Why not? It should have been. Have any steps been taken to review the practice kit to work with people with disability and in particular children and young people with disability? We have gone to some focus groups with um, an advocacy services and included parents um, with a disability in that formulation, but not children, as I understand it. Have you approached any of the peak disability organisations like CIDA, Children and Young People with Disability? 
uh, I would take that on notice. And you and can't. Double, you don't know. I don't know, but I'll double check. Would you accept that if you want to have an effective uh, practice kit that can be a tool to be used by people on the ground, mm -hmm. that it needs to have the input of people with disability? I absolutely agree. Is the practice kit currently required to be used by the Department of Education? No, not Department of Education. No. Is it required to be used by the Department of Housing? No, this is an internal practice kit for our department. Is it used, do you know if it's used by the police? No. And do you know if it's used by health? No. Has um, your department undertaken any training on the risks to children and young people with disability with the Department of Education? As a joint training? At joint training or you've delivered training? No. Have you delivered training to the Department of Housing? No. Have you delivered, delivered any training to police? Uh, not in relation to disability. In relation to interviewing children, yes, but not in relation to dis uh, not a specific disability training program. So police have done some training with the department on interviewing children? Yes. And but not with, not with children with disability? That's right. Uh, has there been any training with the Department of Health on the disability kit? No. Uh, are you aware of whether or not any of those three departments and agencies have uh, used the child safety resources? Are you able to track whether they've used them at no, all? No, I can't track use. Okay, no. But they're publicly available. They are, yes. Uh, one matter which we didn't ask uh, you in the indicative findings, but I just, for uh, completeness, want to ask you about the involvement, if any, with the Queensland Family Child Commission review. You're aware of the review? For this particular case, yes. And uh, was your agency involved in that review? We, uh, information was requested of us and we supplied what was requested. Uh, did that... In include information of a systemic or general nature about policies and practices? Yes, that's right. Did it include uh, all of the records that the department held in relation to the 23 or so notifications and various interactions? No. Is there a reason why that wasn't provided to the QFCC? Um, at the time of the review, um, the older young person was an adult, so the legislation would not have allowed for that. Um, and actually, I'm not sure that the legislation allows for us to share um, information about the individual other young person. And I have read the letter um, that QFCC sent to us in recent days, and that was not requested. Yeah. And you, uh, did your department receive a copy of a report by the Attorney General? Yes. And in terms of that report, what consideration was given to the contents of that report? And I ask you that because yesterday there was some evidence uh, that Ms McMillan drew to the witness's attention. Uh, Commissioners, it's an extra you to Mr Twyford's statement where the attorney says, I'm providing this to the relevant ministers and we assume that it also went to the relevant departments. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so were, were you required by the Attorney General or your minister to do anything in response to the review report? Uh, we certainly reviewed it. What uh, does that mean? Uh, we looked at the findings. So as from memory, um, there were three findings. So it was very COVID-focused because um, of the period of disengagement from school uh, during the COVID closures. Um, so we considered that finding. We had actually worked very actively with education. I'm just asking about the review. Oh, report. yes. Can I just... Yeah. Senior Counsel asked you, were you required to do anything about it? And you didn't quite answer that question. Were you required? You said that you did, but were you asked to do anything? Uh, I don't think there were recommendations for us to follow up on. So if there were recommendations for the department to follow up on, we would do so. But as I recall, they were findings which we reviewed um, to ensure that um, anything significant. So is the answer to that question no, you were not asked to do anything? I would take that on notice. Right. But we always we're very um, 
respectful of the reports that are handed down by QFCC. Well, did anything happen? As a result? Mm. Uh, well, we had, were already doing things that... No, I'm asking not what you were doing before, but what action or what happened, if any, in direct response to the review I report. don't think there were any actions in response to the review itself. Uh, were you required to have any consultation with any other departments no. in relation to the review report? No. Uh, were you required to address any systemic issues? No. Has anything happened in response to this report? Uh, no. That you're aware of? No, no. But I'll take it on notice. I'll come back to you. After the 27th of May, Jonathan was still a child. Mm -hmm. And what were the uh, child safety obligations when child safety became aware that Paul Barrett had passed away? So we assessed whether he was a child in need of protection and a child protection order was sought for him. So he was a child in need of protection? He was. And an order was sought? That's right. And you're aware that a guardian was appointed? Uh, yes. Yes. Late appointed time. All right. I just want to put these two final things to you. Would you accept, um, having looked at the agreed facts, mm -hmm. the underlying documents, and in the course of preparing a statement for this case study, that child safety could have taken action to prevent the violence, abuse, neglect, and the deprivation of rights for both Caleb and Jonathan? I would suggest the department did take action. I'm asking if they could have taken action. Well, they did take action. Will you accept, do you not, that each of Caleb and Jonathan experienced violence, abuse, neglect and a deprivation of their rights during the time they were in their father's care? You yes. accept that? Yes, that was substan there were substantiated outcomes recorded by the department. It didn't need a substantiated outcome. It simply needed observation to know and understand that each of those young men experienced violence, abuse, neglect and a deprivation of their rights. Do you agree? And it is conveyed in our assessment. Right. Do you accept that the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation, deprivation of their rights was preventable? There were attempts to prevent the abuse by supporting the father. But they were preventable, weren't they? There's nothing inherent in these particular children because they had disability that they should be subject of or expect not. to be subject to of course not. Of the course. level of violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of their rights. you agree with that? When you say violence, there was not a pattern of physical abuse of these children. Are you sure about Sorry. that? Are you sure about that? There was one um, allegation of a bruise to the older child's eye. Have you read all the agreed facts? Yes, I have. Have you read the circumstances of a report made to Crime Stoppers about Paul Barrett's uh, physical treatment of the children at a campground? Um, Kicking? I, uh, hitting? I did slapping? Not, no, I did not read that. So I understood that police had intervened at a camping ground and that they found that there was no harm to the children. Do you accept that being locked in your room for a weekend or over the school holidays where you can't get out of the room because there's no handle, you don't accept that's violence? I, I wouldn't regard it as violence, but... What do you regard as violence? Well, What's required of violence? Well, typically violence is a, a violent act towards another resulting in a, in a physical injury. So uh, I'm not suggesting... You don't, that you don't accept coercive this, control as violence? I'm not suggesting that this, these circumstances were adequate for these children. I, please. You are not saying to this Royal Commission that these children did not experience violence, are you? What I'm saying is there was not a pattern of physical abuse of these children oh. in our records. But isn't one in incident of violence enough? Yes, of course, and we and people should respond mm. to that. So I'll come back to my question, which is, do you accept that the violence, abuse, neglect and the deprivation of Caleb and Jonathan's rights was preventable? Yes, and we work to prevent it. Do you accept that child safety was the lead agency in addressing prevention of the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation? Yes, while they were children, absolutely. Do you accept and agree that child safety 
could have done more to prevent the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of rights. I accept what you say earlier, you did things, but you could have done more. We certainly substantiated, we certainly had active follow-up, we opened intervention with parental agreement, we identified that these were children in need of protection you and have we done intervened. You could have done more. Could have done more. Mm. Do you accept that? Yes, all right. And do you accept that you should have done more? Yes. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. Dr. Crawford, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Commissioner Mason. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Crawford, um, there's, a, uh, there's a saying that um, I have come to know since uh, being appointed as a commissioner um, in this Royal Commission, that, that's the phrase, nothing about us without us. Are you aware of that phrase? Yes. And what, what does that phrase mean to you? Well, it, it means a number of things, but it's about involving children, about involving families, about involving communities in decision-making and assessments in decision-making. Um, I don't think that that's what that means, because um, the key element that's missing with your response is disability. So it comes from uh, the, the work and the advocacy from the disability community mm -hmm. in relation to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about ensuring that in decisions that are made regarding a person with disability, that it's for, with and through them. Um, and so I just want to go back. Uh, Ms. Eastman was asking you questions about SCAN. I mean, there were a number of SCAN uh, meetings from the year 2000 mm. um, right up to 2019. Mm. And you've, you've uh, responded to Ms. Eastman's question that there wasn't anyone in those meetings who could provide, uh, who was a subject matter expert in relation to intellectual disability. Um, just wanted just to make sure, uh, be clarified, was there anyone in those meetings um, who was a disability advocate or representing disability services? No, Commissioner, there wasn't. Um, so that phrase, nothing about us without us, in my mind, I'm just listening to the evidence this morning, is not acculturated in the department. As, as it's, it's, it's embedded in the policies, uh, procedures and practices of the department. So uh, here are two uh, young men um, and that in 2020, one was still a child um, and long history of understanding the circumstances in the family. Uh, but there wasn't at any time a mindfulness to uh, connect the community, the disability community, with these young boys. Yes, I can see that. Is that something that department could take on notice to look at? Mm. Um, and I know that you may not be the right person to ask this mm. question, and you may, I, I may ask this question of other witnesses today mm. around that particular phrase, because uh, as a First Nations person, self-determination is acculturated in departments, you know, in jurisdictions for sure, and at the Commonwealth level. Yes. Um, but I think that's a really critical uh, question <coughs> when uh, the, the best approaches and the use of finite resources um, and the urgency of intervention is needed, particularly with children with disabilities and very uh, concerning circumstances, as Ms Eastman has talked about. Yeah, um, so in those scan meetings, uh, you, you responded to Ms Eastman in that your agency was the lead agency. Were there, were there Commonwealth agencies uh, in, in those meetings as well? Was it only state? Yes, that's right, only state. And is there a limitation 
both Commonwealth agents do attend. I would call these integrated response meetings, these scan meetings. Was there a limitation? Uh, scan was actually enshrined in legislation in 2005, and it, the way the legislation is currently written, it doesn't include Commonwealth agencies. That doesn't mean that we can't convene meetings with Commonwealth agencies um, outside or as on a needs basis. So we also have stakeholder meetings and practice panels, those sorts of forums that bring information together. What, what has struck me over the last couple of days is uh, agencies, whether they be Commonwealth or state, and in response to material provided by council assisting um, the representative will say, oh, we didn't know about that. We weren't aware of that. If we knew, we would have done X. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that it's it's not enough to just have some of the representatives in the room uh, in relation to serious risk of harm. Mm. Um, but there needs to be everyone who has a line of sight because not all pieces of the puzzle are actually sitting at that meeting. Mm. Mm. So... Yes, I concede that, Commissioner, and it is why uh, in more recent times we have been able to involve family support agency staff as well. So I think there's, there's certainly some scope um, to review who is at the SCAN team table and who is sharing information. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Thanks, Mr Chair. Ms Crawford. I'm still trying to comprehend your answer to the question that these boys did not experience violence. Have you heard the evidence where we were told that these boys showered night after night in cold water because there was no gas in the house? Where they slept night after night in a room locked from the outside with no blankets, wearing nothing more than a nappy, night after night, cold and hot, in an unfurnished room? where they had no access to the toilet mm -hmm. and they were literally found in the morning slipping around in their own feces and then um, and, uh, um, and they were being fed raw meat uh, but they couldn't even open the packet. Are you seriously telling the Royal Commission that those conditions, which sound like torture to me, mm -hmm. uh, don't represent that these boys did not experience violence? Uh I acknowledge that and I'm sorry for the um, misunderstanding, Commissioner. I was referring to physical abuse at the hands of their father, but I'm sorry that um, there's been a, a, a miscommunication. Well, you'd agree with us that violence is a slightly wider definition Indeed. of physical violence. Indeed, I would agree with you. Ms Crawford, one of the things that occurs to me about your statement mm -hmm. is there is barely any sort of evidence of reflection in it that having, you've read the statement of facts that I have read in the last week. I have. Where there appears to be visit, uh, 20 visits from your department or notifications, multiple visits in which it wasn't, for example, the incident that you were talking about earlier with the senior counsel where one of the boys was seen gnawing on a dog bone. One of the ob other observations made by your staff was that there was one room with an inflatable mattress and several piles of feces. Mm. One mattress outside the home with brown, wet stains. Well, I don't think we need any imagination to understand what that was. And that the home smelled of feces. And yet later on, people go back to the office and they make a conclusion that there's no evidence of harm. There's a certain common sense value to this that the regular member of the public would say, oh, I must say it would to me, that. If those boys are not removed from that house, something seriously needs to happen to improve the circumstances in which they're living, doesn't it? Yes, and I think that was the approach that the department took in the majority of cases. So I'm talking about your statement. There is no reference. There doesn't appear to be any level of reflection that there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that there was an interaction and there seems to be excuse after excuse that kids were non-verbal, um, you know, we didn't see that. There was no one critical incident. There's not an evidence of even reflection in your part that our department, if this could happen on our watch, we need to do something different. And here are some recommendations, perhaps arising from the report done by the Family Commission, where we need to vet. Do you agree that there are no recommendations or suggestions for improvement in your statement? Uh, 
Yes, I, I agree that that I, I did not think that that was the purpose of the statement for the Royal Commission. Um, it is part of my role, Commissioner, to review matters and to make recommendations and actions, and I do that actively as Chief Practitioner. Well, you've had some opportunities, I think, in various questions to answer questions like that and, and, and give some declaration that, look, um, we've read this, we understand this, we're doing something different. And you haven't come with a single suggestion that something's going to improve. It seems very defensive to me rather than reflective and some understanding we're going to do better. I'm sorry I've given you the impression of being defensive, Commissioner. That's certainly not my intent. Um, we, we have um, made considerations of the type of training that our staff uh, require. Um, we, as I mentioned in my statement, we do have um, access to specialist services clinicians now so that our child safety officers staff um, have more disability expertise to consider. Uh, we do, and I have in my statement talked about supervision uh, and the other mechanisms that we are trying to take to address the issues that have been identified through this case. So I'm sorry if that was not as pronounced as it needed to be. Just one item of detail. On paragraph, on, on item uh, line 296 of the agreed statement of facts, I'll read it to you to say that you did. And it says, on the 7th of March, 2019, Queensland police attended home two in the house of uh, person B, where they located Caleb. Queensland police spoke and so on, and they took film on body ca camera footage. Um, and yet, um, later on, at uh, line 301, it says, there were no records the Department of Child Safety received any child protection notifications concerning Jonathan between 5 April and 31 December. Um, I don't see any reference to you receiving a notification from police after that visit. I was just going to ask you, is that because we haven't received it or it's not documented? Uh, because there doesn't appear to have been a notification from police to your department after that visit. No, there doesn't appear to be, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Dr Crawford, one question from me. Uh, I apologise, I can't find the, the specific reference. It was in relation to the situation where your department officials or the caseworkers had attended the home and then spoke to the school mm -hmm. and were satisfied that, that, that because the boys were attending school and the school regularly, there was no further action. Mm -hmm. Is that a usual practice of the, your department? when a similar situation like that happened elsewhere, that you rely on the school and the engagement to the school as satisfactory, irrespective of what might be happening <coughs> at home? Commissioner, not irrespective of what's been happening at home, but we certainly do have strong partnerships with the Department of Education, and we do rely on the information that they can provide us around children's attendance uh, at school and their general well-being. So we, we have strong partnerships with, with education. Did that mean then you rely on the education department to then be fixing or addressing the other issues that you've identified? Uh, I, I um, wouldn't... At home? Yeah, I wouldn't say we rely on them, but we certainly value the information that they can provide about... Um, uh, what they're seeing in the child each day that they are presenting. Uh, and Commissioner, schools are very supportive um, of a, a great many families in our community. Um, I know that the um, Department of Education witness will follow me today, but there are some amazing programs within schools that focus on wellbeing, including breakfast programs and study programs and a lot of well-being and safety support to children that is supplied through education. All right, well, I'll close off by saying, suggesting, however, that's not the whole solution. Is it? No, no, absolutely it, not. And it should not be the whole no, solution. No, it should not, Commissioner. Thank you, Dr Crawford. We're grateful uh, you. for your ongoing uh, contribution to the work that we're doing here at the Royal, Royal Commission. She's not to be uh, excused. So, thank you. Not excused. Uh, I think... Commissioner, uh, could sorry, I ask so that so Dr you, so Crawford not be formally excused uh, in the, I hope, unlikely event that something arises during the course of the balance of the evidence 
that Dr Crawford should have the opportunity to respond to from the other Queensland mm -hmm. witnesses that I'd like you to have that opportunity. You. So you don't have to stay in the hearing room mm -hmm. for the, the day, but just I'd like you to have the opportunity if, if that arises. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr Crawford. Commissioners, uh, I've gone over a little bit of my expected time, but could we have a short, very short break to reconstitute the hearing room? Before we do so, uh, Ms McMillan or other parties would leave to appear. Uh, yeah, uh, thank any you, questions for or asking, but no, and I'm grateful that uh, Ms Crawford may have an opportunity, Dr Crawford may have an opportunity if necessary to respond to some issues that are raised today and also she's taken a number of matters on notice so they will obviously revert back to the Commission. Thank you. Might she stand down at least at this stage? May may she stand down oh, yes, at this yes. time? She is yes. allowed to leave the witness yeah. box. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank Sorry, you. that was legal shorthand. Yeah. Yeah. Ms McMillan, oh no, no, I, I got that. Um, yeah. I need to just be clear, because of my deafness, I'm, I'm about two or three seconds behind the uh, audio, so please bear with me. That's why I don't respond straight away. I'm sure no. you're aware of that. I just oh, want no, to no. make that clear for yeah. everybody. Can I just check, are you clear on the questions on notice? Uh, I think so, but what we'll do is we'll write to the solicitor's assisting and just check that we have them properly. To, and please, no need to apologise. I... Oh, Commissioner. Right, well, thank, uh, thank you. All right, well, uh, Ms Eastman, you were suggesting a very short break. Yes. So, and so how long? Uh, if just, I think, two or three minutes uh, just to reconstitute and then we'll have a, a longer break for morning tea after the next witness. All right, well, in that note... Uh, well, I think we'll complete 10.30. We'll come back at 10.30. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms Marnie. Yes. Uh, Chair, the next witness is uh, Hayley Stevenson from the Department of Education and Ms Stevenson will take an affirmation. Thank you. Ms Stevenson, thank you for coming to the Royal, Royal Commission and to be providing us with evidence and for the material that you've also provided. We're grateful. I'm Commissioner McEwen, this is Commissioner Mason, Commissioner Ryan. The associate who is just down here to your right will, read, will administer the affirmation. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Ms Marnie will now ask you some questions. Uh, your name is Hayley Stevenson, spelled S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. That's right. Uh, and you're the Acting Assistant Director General, Disability Inclusion and Student Services Branch uh, within the Queensland Department of Education. That's right. Uh, you've prepared a statement uh, for the purposes of the Royal Commission and that was dated the 5th of May, 2023. I think I have it the 4th of May. 4th of May, is it? Yep. Uh, have you... Do you have the statement in front of you? Yes. Uh, and you read that statement before you signed it? Yes. And you were satisfied that uh, the contents of that statement were true and correct? Yes. Uh, and there's nothing now that you wish to uh, draw attention to or amend, is there? No. Uh, if I can just first of all turn to paragraph 5 of your statement. You talk about your current role, uh, and that role is for developing policy and delivering strategies and services that support student wellbeing, student protection, student behaviour, and inclusion of students with disability, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse students, and students who identify as 
LGBTIQ. That's correct. Within your portfolio, there's no reference to First Nations students? No, not within my portfolio. So is there uh, another focus, uh, another portfolio that focuses on First Nations students? Yes, so we have a First Nations Strategies and Partnership um, branch. And through all of our work, we Im embed the um, ensuring that we address the needs of First Nations students. So that goes across all of the areas of the portfolio. And what about uh, those First Nations students with disability? Mm -hmm. How does your portfolio interact with that other portfolio? So we work in partnership on a number of, of areas, but embedded within um, our policies and responses around supporting students with disability. It's students with disability who, who may be First Nations, who can may I, be Can I just ask care. you to slow down yes. a bit and also speak up so mm -hmm. uh, everything's captured, but also to take into account that we have interpreters who are in the room and on the live stream. Uh, so if you can just go back and, mm -hmm. and, and just speak about that point again, please. So across all of the policy areas in the branch, we embed support for First Nations students across that. That includes, if we're talking about supports for students with disability, that would be students with disability who are First Nations, for example, or students with disability who might be from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds or perhaps who are in care. So does your unit speak uh, or seek specific advice from the unit uh, or portfolio uh, addressing First Nations students uh, when looking at disabilities within First Nations student cohort? Yes, we work closely with that branch. Um, Ms Brown, can I ask a question? Is there a First Nations person with disability working in the First Nations area or someone with disability? Um, in the First Nations area? I am, am not aware um, of if they have a disability or not. Um, that's something that not necessarily has been disclosed to me. Yeah. Uh, if I can take you to paragraph 10 of your statement, uh, you speak about the evidence in the statement uh, is based upon the school and departmental records and on policies and guidelines in place at the time uh, that uh, you refer to them as young person one and young person two mm -hmm. for attending uh, Department of Education uh, educational uh, facilities, correct? That's right. Uh, so just when we're referring to young person one, you understand that is the person uh, Caleb? Correct. And young person two is the person Jonathan? That's right. So when you reference what you read, did you read the uh, proposed agreed facts? Yes. Uh, and in your statement, you reference a number of uh, documents that have uh, the Disability Royal Commission numbering system. So, for example, at uh, paragraph uh, 34, there's a footnote 5 that references a document, QLD, um, with a then number of numbers after that. Mm -hmm. Did you read each of those documents that you footnoted to your statement? Um, yes, I yes I did, and I have them next to me now. Uh, and when you read those documents, you had no doubt uh, or, or no reason to doubt the contents of those documents, correct? Correct. Yeah. You accepted them as being accurate reports uh, by officers of your department? Yes, correct. Made at the time the report, uh, the document is uh, recorded? Yes. So other than what is referenced in the footnoting and the agreed facts, did you read anything else in preparation for this statement? I read a number of policy documents and other reports, um, pieces of legislation, fact sheets, guidance materials. If I can take you to, uh, just going back a step first, the documents that you referred to in your statement, you've included them really to support the facts of your statement, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, and to support the position that you're putting forward as reflecting your 
uh, views and beliefs. Yes, correct. And reflecting uh, what you say the true position for Department of, of Education was. Yes. If I can just take you first to paragraphs 19 to 21 of your statement, it comes under the heading uh, adjustments and supports provided by the Department of Education for students with disabilities. And at paragraph 19, uh, you state all state schools, including special schools, are required to make reasonable adjustments under, under the Disability Standards for Education 2005, the Anti-Discrimination Act 1991, and the Human Rights Act 2019, being a Queensland Act. Correct. Uh, and you describe at paragraph 20 what adjustments are. And you describe them as measures or actions that address the functional impact of disability on a student's ability to access and participate in education on the same basis as their peers without disability. Yes, correct. So a reasonable adjustment operates to enable a student with a disability to participate in education on the same basis as, as students without the disability. Yes. Uh, reasonable adjustments help to reduce the barriers a student may face or encounter because of the disability. Yes. Uh, and there are strategies or supports that will help students with disabilities to attend school. Yes. And when we look at Caleb and Jonathan, one of those strategies included supported transport. Yes, that's correct. And you refer to that at paragraph 22 and 23 of your statement. Yes. Uh, and note that there was... Uh, supported transport for the boys to travel to school when they were at school. Yes. Uh, you say at paragraph 21, adjustments do not usually include measures or actions that would ordinarily be the responsibility of parents and carers, such as providing clothing and food. That's right. So just to be clear, you accept that the provision of food to a student is not a reasonable adjustment. Because, yes. Uh, and you accept that the provision of clothing to a student is not a reasonable adjustment. Correct. They are matters for a parent or a carer. And they are additional supports for students, for children, yes. So when you say they are additional supports, uh, uh, the provision of food is not an additional support, is it? Isn't the provision of food a basic right as a child? Yes, I, I guess I was meaning in the context of what a school may do. So um, a number of our schools will offer and provide food to, to students as part of a breakfast program or at times will purchase or provide food for, for individual students. So it was more that it might be an additional role that a school will do. Not a reasonable adjustment. Though. Not a reasonable adjustment. And, and you, were you hearing the evidence of Dr Crawford just before? Yes. And Dr Crawford spoke about uh, the school breakfast program that Queensland has rolled out in the past? Yes, correct. Uh, and that is a program uh, that is uh, supported uh, to ensure that uh, all children, not just children with disability, mm. come to school uh, with an appropriate meal in their stomach? Correct? Yes, so um, I believe it is a different government department that funds um, a number of non-government organisations to provide that service in our schools. So those types of supports, though, again, are not reasonable adjustments. They're supports to assist children generally, correct? Yeah, that's right. It, if we go over to... Uh, Paragraph 31, you talk about the adjustments made by School 2 uh, to enable Caleb to access and participate in education. And you set out a number of matters and at subsection D it includes the use of visual, a, uh, visual schedules to assist with movements. Uh, 
At E, it includes personal care, uh, care providing toileting assistance and the like. Uh, and at F, a high level of supervision to ensure safety. However, you go at, if I can take you to paragraph 34, what you say in a, is in addition to adjustments being made to enable Caleb to access and participate in education, departmental records indicate the school staff some supplemented his food, bathed him when he arrived at school, <coughs> provided clean clothes, supplied nappies for use at school and in the home, dropped Caleb off at home, and arranged a haircut for him in February 2018. Yes, correct. You're not suggesting by the words, in addition to adjustments being made, that each of those or any of those were adjustments, are you? No, I'm referring them to as additional support provided by the school to the students. These matters really indicate neglect, don't they? They indicate that additional, that staff felt additional support was required for these students. So additional support means bathing a child when they arrive at school. That's additional support, not neglect. Is that what you say? I think... Um, when referring to the term neglect within the Child Protection Act, um, I would consider that within then the thresholds that are required, that it would be neglect resulting in significant harm or risk of significant harm and then the other element of the um, of the threshold around the parent willing and able. You're aware, though, aren't you, that... Uh, the Department of Child Services did intervene uh, and, and what is referred to as an IPA was mm. commenced in respect of uh, Paul Barrett. Yes, correct. So intervention with parental agreement. Yes. And uh, at the time of the intervention, prior to it, the complaint was the school was having to bath every day the children, correct? Yes, that's right. They were having to provide clean clothes every day, correct? Yes. The fact of an intervention with parental agreement being made, that occurred because there was neglect, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the fact of the school having to provide clothing every day and bathing every day was because of neglect? Yes, so the Correct. school knew that uh, the boys were subject to neglect. And if I recall correctly... No, no, no. I'd like yes. you to answer the question. The school knew the boys were subject to neglect. Yes. At... Footnote 34 at uh, paragraph 154 of your statement. Hundred and fifty four makes reference to a desktop mm. audit uh, that indicated there should have been and I'll go back a step. After uh, Paul Barrett was passed away mm. and the children were found in their the, the terrible state that they were found mm. in. The department undertook a desktop audit, correct? That's correct. And the regional principal advisor of student protection conducted that audit? That's correct. And they made that it, uh, a finding that there should have been a child protection notification in respect to a lump on Caleb's head. That's correct. Were there any other uh, occasions where that audit recommended other child protection notices should have been made? I believe in reading the materials, there was another um, incident 
of a similar date in 2018 in relation to some of the concerns about um, the neglect issues and particularly then an indication that the um, father identified that he's not coping. Uh, and certainly the department doesn't seek to walk away or step away from that audit that mm. there were clear issues of neglect, correct? That in that, yes, yes. And in fact, uh, when we go back to paragraph 115 of your statement, Paragraph 115 of your statement, which comes under the heading Student Protection Reports, you state departmental records also indicate that School 2 undertook steps to address the immediate needs of Caleb and Jonathan by providing clothing, food and supporting their hygiene needs. Yes. That is a history of the school having to address neglect, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you make reference in your statement at paragraph 34, if we can go back to that. Of a haircut being arranged for Caleb in February 2018. You recall that? Yes. You reference in that document, a footnote five, uh, did you read that document? Yes. Uh, did you understand the reasons why the haircut was deemed necessary by teachers? Yes, from my recollection of reading the document, it was because of um, a smell of urine in the hair. And it wasn't a smell of urine on one off, was it? No, I believe it was on a number of occasions and that's why they felt pursuing a haircut was a good course of action. So I'll take you to uh, the document that you rely upon. Commissioners, I understand that the documents have not been uploaded yet to uh, the hearing bundle. Uh, I'll simply identify it at this moment and read it out. It is document QLD uh, 0005, 002, 1360, and it is at page 30, and I'm helpfully assisted, Chair and Commissioners, it is at tab 81 of the hearing book B2. On 13 February 2018, do you see the entry at page 30 of that? Yes. So 13 February 2018, that is a, a couple of weeks after school has commenced, correct? Yes, correct. So school holidays is to the end of January? Yes. So the boys have been back at school for maybe two weeks? Yes. And the uh, school organises a person to cut both Caleb and Jonathan's hair. Uh, the school speaks with Paul Barrett regarding the haircuts. He's happy for that to occur at school. And then there is a note confidential and sensitive notes regarding why I wanted to cut their hair. This was not shared with Dad Paul. Jonathan has been coming in with a strong urine smell in his hair. We have been washing it and giving him showers, and it helps, but the smell of urine is still present, so we are hoping a haircut will help. The response to the school of urine in a student's hair is to wash the child and have the child's hair cut. That's the response, isn't it? That's the response that's documented here, yes. Not we should uh, 
report this to the Department of Child Services? There's no report made for that, is there? There was no report made for that no. incident, no. You would agree, though, wouldn't you, a child coming in on a daily basis to school with a smell of urine in their hair that even washing does not really get rid of uh, is a child protection concern? It is a concern and it is um, for our teachers and professional notifiers to exercise their professional judgment as to whether that um, meets the threshold of significant harm and that a parent isn't willing and able. Well, the position, though, of educators and support staff in the education department is unique, isn't it? It is. You heard the evidence of Dr Crawford. Education is an important part of the work of child protection. Yes, I think we provide a very protective role. You have a unique role where you have eyes on children who are vulnerable. Yes, correct? yes. Who uh, are presenting to school with signs that they may be subject to neglect, correct? That's correct. They may be subject to abuse, correct? That's correct. Violence? Correct. And the department relies, doesn't it, on mandatory reporters to allow them to be able to uh, investigate whether a concern of suspected harm, significant harm, exists? Um, our staff are not able to investigate. That is the role of child safety, but we exactly. will... No, that was my yeah. question. Mm. The department relies on that so they can investigate. That's right. The department relies on education to make the reports so the experts can investigate, correct? That's correct. Staying on page 30, the 30th of May 2018, so this is the same year, correct? Correct. Uh, three months later... Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, which, so what is the 30, date? Yes. Uh, the first entry on that page above the entry of 13 February. 23rd of May. Sorry, 23 May, yes. Thank you. Yeah. If we go to the details of that ent entry, the second line, in particular over the past two weeks, Jonathan has come to school smelling of a strong dog odour, passing rocks, pebbles during bowel movements, and giving, given the cooler days, he has still been attending in only a shirt and shorts. The boys' lunches have been limited on a number of occasions. So this is on the back of the school having to cut the, the boys' hair because of urine smelling, correct? Yes. Over the past two weeks, coming to school smelling of strong odour of a dog? Yes. Of passing foreign matters in their bowel movements? And May 2018, 23rd of May, today's date is 11th of May, attending school in a shirt and shorts. That's correct. Do you agree that each one of those things individually speak of potential neglect of those children? I agree. And cumulatively speak of at least potential neglect? I agree. No report was made on about that either, was there? No, there was no report. And no. there's absolutely no explanation that you can offer as to why a report was not made, correct? Correct, because I don't have... I only have the information written on, on the page. I don't have the other um, experiences, the other information that may have been available to the professional notifiers. Well, it's more than that, isn't it? Didn't your own policies and procedures require you to give primacy to ensure the safety of children attending schools? 
I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Uh, we prioritise the safety and well-being of, of our of students, and I think we we see the actions of the school as absolutely supporting the, the students um, in enacting the Child Protection Act. It, it is around ensuring our school staff um, have the information and the knowledge and the expertise to make a judgment about whether it meets the reporting thresholds as set out in the legislation. So if not, two weeks after starting the school term, there's a continual smelling of urine in the hair that requires a haircut. If not continuing into May, there's uh, for a period in particular over the past two weeks, so you'd agree that that infers there's been other times as well, but in particular over the last two weeks, you'd agree that's open? Yes. Uh, that there's another intractable smell around the students and adding those other matters, wasn't it obvious that this was a matter that ought to have at least been reported to child safety as a suspicion, at least, of possible neglect, possible risk of harm. Yes, I think that we certainly consider that and the desktop audit formed formed that view and that's and the department responded to those findings by delivering a intensive professional development around those matters and um, to, to just that one school it, on this occasion to to that one school and it was intensive ongoing professional development on a, a number of, of matters around record keeping and of writing reports to to child safety to example. this one school to this to this one school we also um, we have a suite of resources, comprehensive information provided to our school staff on making assessments under the Child Protection Act and other pieces of legislation around harm so that they are able to, um, to, to form appropriate judgments and take the courses of action. Did you, though, given the very clear... Well, I'll go back a step. That training was necessary because education perceived that school to, school two number two failed in their child reporting obligations. Correct. It was the view that we saw an opportunity to strengthen their understanding and their approaches around student protection reporting. And the reason that you needed to strengthen their understanding and reporting is because they simply were not performing it in a manner expected of them, correct? From what we could see through a desktop audit in written documents, we felt there was opportunities for their approach to be strengthened because there wasn't documentation to suggest that the most fulsome response had been undertaken. Well, well for many of these... Uh, issues arising, there had been no response to child services, had there? There had been, there was some conversations at, at different times. There hadn't been a student protection report yes. um, and it other is than in, 20, in yeah, 2010. So the one report in 2010 for the uh, number of years, the, the, almost their entire educational life at that school for both Caleb and Jonathan, one report. That's correct. That's a failing, isn't it? In looking at where the situation ended and looking back, yes. And not only looking at where it ended, but looking at the material that the school was aware of, that you have looked at in preparing this statement, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, the school took a supportive response not necessarily a, a, a reporting response. And in taking this supportive response, it was supporting the immediate needs of the children, correct? Yes. Uh, but it was also supporting the utter neglect that was occurring in the home that led them to come to school every day in the state they came. 
Yes, and I think over time, and it's evident in in the documentation from the school and also from other support services, is that um, there were periods of time where there were no concern, like number of years where there were no concerns raised. So it did seem that um, it was sporadic in, in nature, intensified at, at some points of time in the uh, students' schooling. Is it fair to say, though, that the approach that was taken by the school of, in your words, supporting as opposed to reporting, had the effect of enabling Paul Barrett in his uh, uh, substandard level of care for the children? Yes. And in terms of those periods where you say no concerns were raised, in circumstances where it was considered the reporting of the school was deficient and could be improved, the lack of reporting could well reflect the fact that they just did not make records of what was being observed. I think there's evidence that records of contact were being made rec um, and that so there was there was a series of, of documentation being made around a, a range of matters communicating with the father communicating with other support services for for the children so there was a history of records being made but there were also some some gaps that were identified through the audit, and so that was another element was record keeping so that was addressed. It is quite possible that the lack of concerns raised is a result of insufficient record making. Possible. It's possible. Yes. If I can take you to paragraph 118 of your statement. Again, this is still under the student protection report topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, you refer to uh, what was required to submit a student protection report as at May 2006. Do you see that? Yes. And you refer to uh, a risk of harm, they're the words in your statement. Yes. Those, is that the words that you extracted or the school department of education extracted from the child protection act at that time um from the act or from our policy in 2006 i think that would have been from our policy uh, your policy though in terms of assessing risk of harm to children mm -hmm. uh, would have uh, it was it driven though uh, by the statutory definition mm -hmm. of harm in the child protection act yes and so you were uh, also aware, and when I say you, I mean the Department of Education, was also aware that as at May 2006, the uh, Child Protection Act at Section 9, Subsection 3, noted or stated that harm can be caused by physical, psychological or emotional abuse or neglect. Yes. The Department of Education proceeded, didn't it, on the basis that its staff understood the concept of harm within those terms. Yes. They understood that uh, neglect constituted harm, could constitute harm. Yes, that's correct. Uh, if I can take you now to paragraph 128, uh, which comes under the heading of self-harming behaviours, I, I, I would draw that, it's still under the heading of the student protection reports, but uh, paragraph 128 refers to Autism Queensland OT uh, describing certain behaviour of uh, of either 
Caleb or Jonathan as self-harming behaviours. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. And at paragraph 129, uh, you reference it not being uncommon for children with autism to engage in behaviour which can lead to injury. That's correct. Uh, and you say it's not intended to result in harm or injury and is usually a mechanism to self-soothe and communicate needs as a result of some form of anxiety. That's right. And at paragraph 130, you form the opinion that the self-harm reported appears to be a functional impact of a young person's disability, correct? Yes. So this was in respect of uh, Caleb self-harming, as reported by yes. Autism Queensland occupational therapist. Yes. Are you rejecting at paragraph 130 the professional opinion of someone from Autism Queensland describing behaviours as self-harming? No, I think that... That has accepted that um, that those behaviours were occurring, and that an individual management plan needs to be put in place to manage those behaviours. But your response at a paragraph 130 is that the self harm is actually a functional impact of the disability. Yes, but that and and, yeah. and in doing that what you're seeking to do is water down the significance of an OT describing behaviours as self-harming, correct? No, I don't agree with that. It is that it that the response required for those behaviours is an individual management plan response by the schools. It's not accepting that we want those behaviours to continue or that those behaviours are inevitable. It's identifying that they're occurring and that the school needs to look at those behaviours and to implement a management plan to reduce the likelihood of them reoccurring, the severity of the impact on them occurring. So to determine what the function of that behaviour is for the young person and to develop a plan to meet the function of that behaviour in another way. And you're expecting school to, to, to do that upon that report being received by the Autism Queensland OT? Yes. And at paragraph 132, you state... The school records do not directly address whether specific supports were provided to address this concern. That's correct. And over at uh, paragraph 135, there is a, another reference to Caleb engaging in behaviours of increased hitting his head with the palm and spitting, his teacher hypothesising that he had potential stomach issues, and suggesting the young person needed a medical review, correct? That's correct. And at 136, you reject that behaviour uh, as being self-harming behaviours, the hitting the head with the palm, uh, and you say it's likely to be a result of disability. Yes, that's, that's correct. Again, what you're seeking to do in that is to diminish the fact that a child with a disability may be displaying self-harm behaviours and you are simply attributing behaviours to a global disability response, correct? It is looking at what the function of the behaviour may be to then design a response that reduces the likelihood and severity of those behaviours continuing in, into the future. I don't so, think that was the question I asked. Okay, what was, what was the question? My apologies. I'll approach it a different way. Were you here for the last evidence? Yes. Uh, you heard about the uh, unconscious bias? Yes. What I want to suggest is that your position at paragraph 130 and 135 is a clear example of unconscious bias where you're uh, looking at a child's behaviours 
and explaining them solely through a lens of disability as opposed to taking on board expert view that may suggest the child is in fact self-harming in spite of having a disability or in addition to having a disability. Okay, that was not the intention of that. It was about looking at the function of the behaviour but, but the, and addressing that's it. That's the effect of your statement, isn't it? That you have looked at Caleb as simply a child with a disability and all behaviours can be attributed to that disability. No, I, I reject that. I'm looking at a report saying that Caleb is engaging in self-injurious behaviour that we see frequently displayed in, in children who have autism or other, other um, concerns and that then the response needs to address the functions of those behaviours. And I think there is evidence through the, the case notes of the interventions that the school had put in place around identifying some of the triggers and the escalating behaviours that they might see in Caleb um, and, and how to, to intervene. So it was identifying that those behaviours are likely associated with the disability, but in no way accepting that that doesn't mean that we need to address address the functions of the behaviours. But it was never looked at, though, in through the lens that the Autism Queensland OT looked at it as these are self-harming behaviours, correct? There, there's no documentation to suggest that occurred. In terms of uh, school attendance during COVID, and you address this at paragraph 50 and 53 of your statement, You say at paragraph 50, during this period, and being meaning the period of COVID, children of essential workers, children who lived in designated Indigenous communities and vul vulnerable students could attend school. That's correct. And at paragraph 53, uh, you say vulnerable children who could attend school during school closures included children who received services from child safety, including those on a child protection order, and children subject to a youth justice order. That's correct. There's nothing in that uh, definition, for want of a better expression, that includes students who have significant needs due to, for example, disability and a lack of parental uh, capacity in the home. No, at that time, there's no reference to that. Um, However, we were learning in this process and subsequent advice was issued that provided further examples to school at, to schools as to um, what might uh, on what a vulnerable child you know, might might be. So we, we realized that that was a narrow definition and we received questions from schools as to, would this student qualify as, as vulnerable? And so we issued additional advice to expand on, on that definition. So at the start of COVID, uh, students in the position of Caleb and Jonathan were not deemed vulnerable for the purposes of being able to have contact in person at a school. Even with the narrow definition, the principals had had the discretion Sorry. to accept um, any any vulnerable child. But correct, but that was in the first so, so, couple of days. The, the question was: children such as Caleb and Jonathan did not fall within the definition of vulnerable in the first in the early days of the definition. At paragraph 58 and 59 of your statement, you say that parents determined whether their child attended mm. school during COVID-19 school closures. Schools could not compel parents to send their children to school and that some parents with students of disability were reluctant. That's correct. You're not suggesting, are you, that Paul Barrett fell into one of those categories of parents, are you? Yes, well, the parent, it was up to a, a parent to 
to decide to send their child to school during the closure period. Some parents with disability um, whose children are particularly vulnerable to, I'll to not illness. Give this is about Paul Barrett. Did you find any record that supported Paul Barrett was informed that he could send Caleb and Jonathan to school during COVID? Um, I'm unaware of any records that indicated that. I'm aware that school packs were delivered okay. to the home. Were you aware uh, whether anyone attended on his home to inform him of any changes of the definition of vulnerable so that Caleb and Jonathan could attend school? I'm not aware whether that occurred or not. And in the absence of records, is it more likely it simply did not occur? Um, I'm not sure because the packs were delivered in person and so I'm not sure of the nature of the conversation that occurred when and the packs were delivered. Did you seek to make any inquiries or did anyone seek to make inquiries about that? Not that I have in, in the records in front of me. Uh, at paragraph 160 and 161, you make reference to the Queensland Family and Children's Commission investigation of your statement. That's correct. Uh, so when did education become aware that that uh, review was being conducted? Was it on the 5th of June when you received the letter? I believe so. Uh, and you engaged in that process by providing documents? Yes, that's correct. We provided documents requested from us. Uh, did those documents include documents that uh, disclose confidential information about the circumstances of uh, Caleb and Jonathan? I don't believe so because I believe the review was conducted under the legislation, um, the previous legislation that didn't provide the QFCC with the with those particular powers. And what you're referring to is that uh, following that letter uh, on, I think, the 1st of July of that year, the Child Death Review Board came into play? That's correct. And it was anticipated that that board would undertake uh, a parallel investigation? Yeah, we were advised that there would be a further review enacting the, the new powers in, in regards to that matter. Did that advice uh, impact on the department's decision to uh, investigate the circumstances of Caleb and Jonathan's experience at school? Um, our, our investigation occurred prior to the 5th of June, so prior to receiving the initial advice from the QFCC about their internal review. And is that that desktop review, the that's, desktop audit that you're referring to? That's correct. That suggested there were two occasions where child protection reports could have been made throughout the whole duration of the boys attending that school? That's correct. Uh, when the uh, report by the Queensland Family and uh, Child Commission was prepared, uh, that was provided to the Attorney-General? That's correct, I believe uh, so. The Attorney General uh, provided it to various ministers. Are you aware whether the Minister for Education received that? Um, I'm aware that the department received the, the report and, and so I assume that was through the, the Minister, and but I could check that. That report is the uh, unredacted report. So it had uh, Caleb and Jonathan's name, it had the circumstances of their home life, the circumstances of their school, I believe so, but I would would like to check that to, to confirm. Were you provided with a copy of that report? Yes, I was. What did you do with that report? We reviewed the findings of, of relevance to us. They were mainly in relation to um, the definition of vulnerable vulnerable child, as you um, pointed out, for, for during the school closure period and ensuring greater supports and reaching out to schools so that they are able to communicate proactively with parents about sending their, their vulnerable child to school. So it was quite a limited scope in terms of how education read that report? 
well, they were there, our findings for consideration, uh, for our consideration. You're aware, aren't you, that the report that was due to be undertaken by the Child Death Review Board uh, did not occur? I only became aware of that when I um, listened to the, the Commissioner's um, evidence, yesterday. Ev evidence yesterday. Uh, given you, you've read uh, the proposed statement of agreed facts relevant to Queensland, haven't you? Yes. You've read an awful lot of documents from the school, correct? Correct. Given the fact that the Child Death Review Board did not undertake a deep dive review and the Department of Education only undertook a desktop audit, in light of all the information that you now have, do you consider that there would be utility to Queensland Department of Education in conducting a much more detailed review that addresses the management of child protection, children with disabilities and reporting? I think there's um, potential for that to be valuable to us in following the processes that our child death review team now undertakes as they have done since the 1st of, of July. I do agree that um, that we can strengthen our, our approach in, in supporting students with disability and ensuring they have particularly a voice around their own safety. So I think that there is improvements we can make. And given that view, is it a position that you would be advocating for such a review to in fact take place? Um, I hadn't turned my mind to it previously, but I think that there's an opportunity for us to certainly learn a lot from this case, so would be supportive of a review being conducted. In terms of Caleb and Jonathan, how they presented to school uh, over many years, as captured in the documents, you would accept that there were signs available to staff and teachers of education of actual or potential violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of their rights while they were in their father's care? Yes. And you were ex would also accept that they were in fact subject to violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of their rights during their period of uh, time at school by reason of their father's care? Yes. Do you accept that it didn't have to occur? The fact of their disability did not mean that they had to be subject to the neglect, abuse, violence and deprivation of their rights? Absolutely. And the Department of Education, it could have done much more by reporting concerns to either limit or to help stamp out that neglect, violence and abuse Caleb and Jonathan suffered. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? We, yes, I agree. There are opportunities for that reporting to have been strengthened. And not only opportunities, they in fact should have done more to protect those children young people to protect Caleb and Jonathan from the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of their rights that they did suffer. The department should have done more, shouldn't they? In looking back, yes, we should have done more. I think there is evidence of the school implementing a great deal of support for for both the students. So I guess it's to that the while yes there could have been more reporting, I think it speaks to the support that schools provide our students, that schools do go, you know, above and beyond in in the support area. And so I guess I just wanted to put that on on the record that our schools do um, 
if, if, I if they do implement if I a number say, of say actions, this, yeah. clearly the student, the, the, the Caleb and Jonathan, uh, the school staff tried to make their lives better. Yes. But you'd have to accept in doing so they enabled the behaviours of Paul Barrett. Yes. And they did not appropriately respond to the apparent child protection concerns as they were presenting. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, there are all the questions that I have. Yep, thank you, Ms. Mani. Ms. Stevenson, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, um, for a moment, I'd just like to focus on what schools do, which is teaching and learning. Um, I accept all the, I don't in any way want to trivialise the other things, but one of the contributions you could have made through schooling is teaching and learning. Would you agree with me if the young men were able to express themselves better, they might have, they might have been able to explain their condition better to community services officers or others that they're in trouble? Um, yeah, yes, possibly if they're able to express them themselves. And I think in the materials, you can see that there was extensive work around try, attempting to support the voice communications and extensive communication plan and, and strategies around um, understanding and facilitating that, that communication with the voice. You also would agree the two boys spent most of their time in a special education development unit, which is a school, I understand, specifically designed to meet the needs of people with disability mm -hmm. better than any other circumstance, perhaps. Um, You've described in your statement in, at, um, at, uh, at uh, paragraph 31 that the boys received a highly individualised curriculum to year 10 and then so, so what did you mean by highly individualised? Um, in that it would take into consideration the boys' cognitive development, their communication skills, their, their interests, um, which which throughout the documents you can see that the, the staff have identified Caleb and, and Jonathan's different interests and tailor the, the education and engagement around, around those. Also in the record showed some of the, um, the really positive experiences that the schools provided to both boys, such as I think they attended school camps every year, went to the Ecker excursion, went to the planetarium. So I, they had a, a rich experience um, at the school. That's true. But I, I'm, um, first of all, uh, in regard to individualised, I can't help but notice the description of the individualised program received by both boys appears to be almost exactly the same in your statement. There's, so they weren't individualised in terms of each other. Mm -hmm. But among the things you've listed is that uh, you were supporting uh, Caleb's aspirations to work in supported employment or a volunteering role. How did you how did you determine that he had an aspiration to uh, work in a supported employment or volunteering role? Um, based on the documentation through the communication that staff would would have with with Caleb through the communication tools such as the you know, the the pod book and their other augmented communications. Um, I've, and as you probably have been out to to many um, to many schools and see the efforts that our teachers and teacher aides go to to ensure that students have a have a voice and have an agency. The, you you do in fact refer to the use of the pragmatic organisation dynamic display books. Um, there doesn't appear to be any evidence that that was ever used at home or used. I mean, was mm. the school having any success with that? Uh, I don't have that in in my records as to any of their attempts that I can recall anyway to have um, Dad engage in that. We don't have a long time for a long investigation of this, but by all reports by other people who had interacted with the, boy, the boys, they basically described them as nonverbal and not able to communicate in any way. Mm -hmm. Yet it appears there's a miracle going on at school that they're communicating with books is there not a possibility that maybe that wasn't happening at school? Oh, I, I looked, read the, the materials and saw that the, the staff have identified that 
body language was a, a really strong mechanism to use. And I believe it might have been Jonathan who displayed 50% 50, 50 accuracy around the, the use of, of other, other words. So the school was continually attempting to increase the, the communication and in reading the Autism Queensland reports as well from the, the weekly sessions there, we could see that their, um, while it did wax and wane over time, that the communication skills improved over time and they were able to pinpoint some of those um, effective communications over time. That uh, this appears to be straying slightly outside of the agreed facts, uh, and for procedural fairness and other reasons, uh, we're working to keep it within the agreed facts. Well, I, I suppose the, the the in your review that you refer to the desktop review, there's no reference in that to examining the educational program that the boys did as to whether that mm. needed improving, given that it's had a, a particular potential to impact on many of the other things, surely one of the things the department would look at is whether or not every effort made to, to educate the young boys could have led to a position where they might have been in a position to speak for themselves, however limited. Mm. But the school didn't seem to have achieved that. And um, I'm just wondering why wouldn't you want to be looking particular? Now, it's all very well to talk about child protection, mm. but the one thing you'd expect Department of Education look at us. How do we support these kids in through their curriculum and through their learning? Do you agree with me? There's no reference in your statement to that. Yes, I, I agree. And would that be something that might be worthwhile addressing? Yes, absolutely. That's the only point I want to make. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Um, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Chair. Sorry, this air conditioning in this room takes my voice away. Um, a bit, bit husky. Um, I'm interested uh, in asking um, a similar question that I asked the previous witness about um, that phrase, nothing about us mm. without us, and, and to ask of your understanding of that phrase. Yeah, that whenever we're making, whenever we make decisions about people, they need to be, have an active voice in, in the decision making and I can see that we have some ways to go to ensure that, that students with disability have an active voice at all times in decision making. I do see that occur in the schools when I've been on, on school visits. That and an example was a recent school visit where the students who were in year 12 showed me through their storyboards that were up on the walls that were describing what their future aspirations were through the images that they that they place up there. So I think our our school staff endeavour to ensure our students have a have a voice in the decisions about them. Um, and what's your understanding of ableism? That we come from um, that conscious unconscious bias of um, viewing the world uh, viewing the world from a perspective that we all have the, the same abilities that I guess that's the starting point as opposed to looking for those opportunities and actively ensuring that there are no barriers to people being able to actively participate. Mm. Um, Ms Mahoney went through a number of incidences uh, with the uh, boys, um, one or both, with their with, with concerns that the school was seeing, um, such as urine in their hair, passing foreign objects like, like rocks, a uh, strong dog owner, um, and uh, we've heard today that there were no reports made to child safety. Um, reflecting on that, if it was a if it was a child without disability, would would that situation warrant the same 
decisions made by staff in a school. If oh. they were seeing children, mm -hmm. two boys in the same family, yeah. um, and having to be provided with additional assistance by teachers because they needed breakfast or they needed clothes, they needed washing, um, they were passing foreign objects. Uh, if it was a, if it was children who could speak up for themselves, if they weren't with children with disabilities, would it be seen as it wouldn't be any different in the way that the circumstances transpired? Um, I, I've reflected on that in in looking at um, the statement and the and the materials. I know firsthand that our schools will provide those additional supports to to any student that requires them, whether the student has a disability or not. I know that schools also take into consideration and weight very heavily the ability of, of parents to, to support. So I actually looked at the um, at our student protection reporting data to see if that if there was any trends in there. And we actually see that 40% um, of the student protection reports submitted by our schools every year, and that's sort of upward of 25,000 reports each year, 40% relate to students with disability, whereas students with disability comprise only 20% 20, 20 of our student population. So our, our staff are reporting concerns um, around, around that, but our schools also provide those additional supports to a range of students who may need them. Do you think those examples that council assisting is read out, not read out, that um, an ordinary person could look at those circumstances and see that they it, that, that it could be perceived as ableism by the teachers in that it wasn't to do with their disability, they needed other supports to be given to the students, to the two boys, and um, that they needed to have a level of protection because of what was happening at home. Yeah, I think you could, it could be reasonably perceived as that. Thank, and thank you for your evidence today. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson, one question for me, and it relates to paragraph 31. Commissioner Ryan asked you about 31 subclause B <coughs> and then sub subclause R1 about transition for, to life after school, which included his aspiration to work in supported employment or a volunteering role. Is there anything on the record in your school record did they talk about aspiration to go into mainstream open employment? Not that was recorded in the documents that I was able to see. Well, we've heard a lot in this Royal Commission about the Polish pathway. Are you familiar with that phrase? No. The Polish pathway is described where we've heard about disabled kids going straight from special school to sheltered workshop. So reading your statement alone just confirms the low expectations that schools have of disabled kids. Do you agree with my proposition that if you've got no record of talking to Caleb or Jonathan about their aspiration for life after school, it's straight to a what we call now an Australian disability enterprise, formerly known as or still known as Shredded Workshop. Do you agree with my proposition that reading your statement alone confirms the low expectation that you have of kids with Disabilities. I confirm that that's how it could could be read in this case. All right, I might. Oh, well, I'm finished with my questions, uh, Miss McMillan. Yes, yes, I just have a couple of questions. Thank you, Miss Stevenson. You were asked earlier by Miss Mahoney um, in a passage of evidence. Um, she asked the fact of an intervention with parental agreement being made that occurred because there was neglect. Correct. She said, yes, that's correct. She says, and the fact that the school having to provide clothing every day and bathing every day was because of neglect, yes. So the school knew that the boys were subject to neglect. And you answered, and if I recall correctly, and then Ms Mahoney said that wasn't the question, um, what were you going to add at that time? Uh, and if I recall correctly, it was that the school then saw an improvement in 
the boys' conditions and a decrease in their need to provide those supports when there was the IPA in place. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, in terms of, um, you were asked questions about vulnerable students during the COVID period, and you said in the early days that they would not have uh, fallen within that definition. What, when you say early days, what would you mean by early days? In the first one or two days of the closures, and then we received questions and clarification from school, so we realised that our definition required a little more detail and so issued that advice. And you talk about school packs. What were they? So they were the um, curriculum materials, the lesson plans that the, that the students would be learning from home. That with. they would what in, need to in, enable to work from yeah, home. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. At that time, was Caleb still at school or was he an adult? He was an adult. Yes, all right. Um, thank you. Uh, nothing further with this witness. Might she be excused? Yes, but... but we probably just quickly check with the other I'm party sorry. with leave to appear. No, uh, yes, she may be excused, and I'll now just check. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, no. Uh, one thing I did have to add: I did obtain instructions, um, Commissioner Mason, that the Indigenous, the First Nations branch, do have one staff member who has disclosed having a disability in that division. Thank we can put that in writing if if the commission requires it. Thank you. We uh, appreciate that additional information. Ms Marnie, uh, what Chair, next? Chair, I think we're going to a morning tea break now uh, till midday. Uh, and if I can just note uh, for the parties, uh, the pronunciation of my surname is Marnie. So it sounds like M-A-R-N-E-E. Thank you for that clarification. Ms Stevenson, thank you for your contribution. We very much appreciate it. You may be excused, and we will now adjourn until 12 noon. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. The next witness you'll see is with us in the hearing room, Detective Superintendent Denzil Clark from the New South Wales, uh, sorry, New South Wales, Queensland Police Service. Uh, what I'm proposing with the Detective Superintendent's evidence is to go as far as I can in the open session, but at the end of that when I reach that point, I'll ask the Commission to close the hearing room and the only people permitted in the hearing room will be the Royal Commissioners, the Royal Commission staff and the parties with leave, other than Detective Superintendent, all other witnesses and anybody else will have to leave the hearing room for what will be a short period of time, but as I said earlier, it can be their early lunch adjournment. And uh, I understand detect the detective superintendent will take an affirmation. I'm going to do an oath. But uh, do it. I've got affirmation here. If you prefer an oath, that's fine. doesn't bother me either. Okay. Uh, Mr Clark, thank you very much for coming and to providing your forthcoming evidence as well as the material that you've provided. I'm Commissioner McEwen. <coughs> this is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. If you would follow the introduction of the associate, she will read out, which I presume will be the affirmation. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. 
Thank you. So can I confirm you are Denzel Clark? Correct. And you hold the position of Detective Superintendent of Police, Queensland Police? Yes. You prepared a statement for this case study in the Royal Commission dated the 8th of May? Yes. You've had an opportunity to read the statement? Yes, I have. And are there any corrections that you wish to make to any parts of the statement? Not at this time. And they're otherwise true and correct? Yes. Now, in the course of preparing the statement, you had an opportunity to review the agreed facts? Correct. Or proposed agreed facts? Yes. You also had an opportunity to review a range of documents, including a document that was a timeline prepared by your staff on or around uh, late May, is that right? Oh, of this year? <coughs> yes, so there, there were two timelines, one prepared in 2020 and then uh, an updated version prepared uh, this month. All right. And uh, based on everything that you've reviewed, you're satisfied both at the time and you continue to be satisfied with the police responses in relation to Jonathan and Caleb. Is that right? Yes, I am. And it's um, your position, is it not, that you have not identified any opportunity for policy or procedure improvement. Is that right? Correct. And have you followed the conduct of these proceedings since Monday? No, I have not. Has anyone briefed you as to what's occurred over the past two days? Not in any detail, no. And to the extent that you hold the position that, uh, as far as you're concerned, you're satisfied with the responses and you haven't identified any opportunity for policy or procedure improvement, uh, that is without the benefit of hearing or reviewing the evidence presented over the past few days. Is that, that right? That's correct. My opinion has been um, formed on the material available to me prior to that. All right. Just conscious of the time, uh, we're grateful that you've set out your relevant professional experience in the police service and including particular experience in relation to child protection. And they're the matters set out in your statement from paragraph two through to paragraph uh, four. So can we take that as read? Yes. And unless there's anything that you want to tell the Royal Commission about your experience? No. Uh, can I ask you, in the course of your professional life with the Queensland Police, have you ever undertaken any particular training with respect to people with intellectual disability who are victims of crime? Not that I can recall um, specifically for people with disabilities. We do have training in relation to vulnerable people. <laughs> but intellectual disability? Not specific that right. I can recall. Uh, do I take it that in the nature of the work that you've done, you've had some training in relation to children and young people as victims of crime? Yes. Have you had uh, any opportunity to undertake any training with respect to people with disability who are non-verbal, who are victims of crime? No. In the course of your professional life with police, have you done any training with respect to the rights of people with disability generally? Um, not as a specific vulnerable group, but as, again, uh, as vulnerable people, we certainly have had a lot of training of late in particular. When you use the expression vulnerable, you'd accept this proposition, would you not, that people with disability are not inherently vulnerable, but the description of vulnerability arises because of the circumstances around the person with disability? Yes. You're not suggesting that vulnerable and disability are interchangeable, are you? No. Uh, in terms of uh, the rights of people with disability, have you ever heard of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Not specifically, no. When you say not specifically, what do you mean by not specifically? <coughs> well, I should have said no. You've not heard of it. Have you followed any of the work of this Royal Commission over the last four years? No, I have not. In terms of general policing duties, do you have any knowledge as to whether or not police throughout their uh, careers, so I'm talking about people at perhaps a, a lower level to you, and the sorts of police who might deal with the sort of day-to-day -day interaction of the community, so that cohort. Are you aware whether general duties police are required to undertake any training with respect to engagement and communication with people with intellectual disability? I do not believe we have any training of that nature. And what about people with disability who are non-verbal or require communication in different ways? 
there's no specific training that I'm aware of. Right. Are you aware that the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs has issued a practice kit with respect to children and young people with disability? No. Have the uh, Department of Children, Youth Justice, Multicultural Affairs, formerly, and my shorthand, Department of Child Safety, have they done any work with uh, Queensland Police in relation to identifying risk factors or vulnerabilities, to use your expression, for children and young people with disability? Not that I can recall. Right. Now, um, in terms of your professional experience, what has been your professional experience with respect to undertaking an investigation of neglect? Well, um, I've been a detective since 1990. Uh, from that time, I've been heavily involved in the child protection field and I have conducted multiple investigations uh, of uh, neglect, harm and, and offences against children. Well, just on neglect, so uh, so that we've got a common understanding and it would help yeah. me, what do you mean by the expression neglect in the context of children? Failure to provide uh, support or services to that child which is detrimental to their physical, psychological or emotional well-being. And what would be the indicia of neglect? Well, um, it could be their physical state. It could, as I said, it could be a, an emotive or psychological. So, um, I'm not exactly sure. Would how you do like... you? Well, let me put it more simply. How do you identify neglect? Um, from our observations and and evidence that we obtain from others. So. If you're talking about attending a residence, it may be the state of the house. It may be the um, relationship between the parents and the child. It may be evidence of uh, the, the, the uh, of lack of food, clothing, uh, or other forms of care or medical support. Uh, and in terms of the number of investigations that you would have done with a particular focus on neglect, are you able just to give us a ballpark figure of the number of investigations? No, I couldn't. Um, it's, it's very rare that you would do just a neglect um, investigation. Usually there would be some other um, type of harm that we would be investigating, so physical, sexual, as well that goes with that, or as part of doing those investigations, you will see signs of potential neglect. And uh, is there any particular sort of matrix or guideline as to how a police officer might undertake an investigation in relation to neglect? Um, I don't know. I don't think we have a matrix as such. We rely on their experience as police officers to determine whether they have concerns or serious concerns in relation to that child and then there, there's a course of action to be taken. All right. Now, you've got a copy of your statement with you. Oh, I do. Uh, can I ask you to turn to, sorry, I don't have page numbers, but paragraph 17. Yes. <clears throat> so you're telling the Royal Commission that the Queensland Police does not hold the responsibility, one, nor do members possess the expertise, two, to properly assess risk to children to determine if a child has suffered is suffering or is at unacceptable risk of suffering significant harm? That's correct. That, that language comes from the definition of harm in the Child Protection Act. Is that where you've got that from? Correct. So you had regard to Section 9 of the Child Protection Act? Yes. And in terms of uh, that concept of harm, you say that's not an area that we as police have responsibility or relevant expertise, is that right? Yes. And if there is expertise and a responsibility in relation to risk of harm, that's child safety, not us, is that right? Yes, so we will identify uh, our concerns and then we will take it to the appropriate authority, which in this instance is um, child safety. Right. And at paragraph 18 you say, though, that Queensland Police is responsible for the investigation of allegations of child harm, which may amount to a crime and where warranted commence criminal prosecutions. Correct. Now, implicit is it not in paragraph 18 that if Queensland Police are to investigate 
allegations of child harm, then Queensland police need to know and understand what harm means. Do you agree with that? Um, How can you investigate something if you don't know what it means? Well, I think we know what harm means, and we know the definition under the Child Protection Act, yeah. uh, but whether it constitutes a criminal offence is the point being made there. Right. So do you have to know what the offence is first so that when you investigate for the purpose of identifying an offence, harm might come into the mix? Is that what you're saying? No. What I'm saying is that if we receive information okay. which there is a potential um, offence or the significant harm to a child, then we will investigate it and depending on the facts, we could determine the particular crime. But if um, Queensland Police do not have the expertise to properly assess the risk of a child uh, suffering significant harm, is that not a limitation in terms of police capacity to investigate allegations of child harm? No, I, I see them as two separate pieces. Can I ask you then about the police function in relation to section 364 of the Queensland Criminal Code? No doubt you're familiar with that section. Oh, perhaps you could remind me. It's called... <coughs> I don't know if we've got it to come up. It's cruelty to children? It's called cruel, cruelty to children yeah. under 16. It's just coming up on the screen. Yep. Is that something you're familiar with? Yes. And no doubt in the course of your professional life and experience in child protection matters you would have had many occasions to consider this particular offence. Is that right? Correct. And uh, you're aware, aren't you, that the, uh, this provision was amended with effect in 2008 and the amendment was to include the definition of harm in subparagraph 2 and to move the description of the nature of harm, which is now prescribed conduct into subparagraph two. But the new part was the inclusion of harm. Are you aware of that? I wasn't aware of the date, but I have read the section as it exists today. Right. So this provision has been in operation for some period of time. Have Correct. Have you, in the course of your professional life, had opportunity to charge and then prosecute any offences in relation to section 364? I, I don't recall using Section 364. You don't recall? No, I don't. I may have, but I don't recall. Mm -hmm. Just looking at the operation of the uh, provision, the offence applies to the person, would apply to the person who has lawful care or charge of a child under 16. Yes. The elements of the offence is causing harm to the child. Yes. I'm sorry, I can hear Ms McMillan. Did you want to say something? No, thank you. And in terms of the way in which the harm is to be caused, there's the prescribed conduct, and if we look at that... That includes, among other things, failing to provide the child with adequate food, clothing, medical treatment, accommodation or care when it is available to the person from his or her own resources. You see that? Yes. Or failing to take lawful steps to obtain adequate food, clothing, medical treatment, accommodation or care when it is not available to the person from their own resources. Yes. So that covers two distinct things, does it not? Yes. One is if, for example, the person with lawful care, let's say parent, for example, fails to provide within their own resources, that can be conduct that may trigger an element of the offence. You agree? Yes. And likely, likely, if the parent doesn't have that capacity, then the failing to take lawful steps to secure adequate food, etc., will also trigger the offence. Is that right? Yes. Now, there's an element that the person who um, engages in the offence has to have knowledge or ought reasonably to have known, what would be likely to cause harm to a child? You agree? Yes. And then harm uh, covers a range of factors, but it must involve a detrimental effect of a significant nature to a child's physical, psychological or emotional well-being. Yes. 
So that's a fairly strong provision in the Criminal Code to protect children under 16 from cruelty. Yes. Are you aware of this provision ever being used to charge any parent in relation to the parent failing to provide food, adequate food, clothing, medical treatment, accommodation or care? Well, I do not know. Would you agree that uh, looking at the whole of the material available to uh, you, so the agreed facts and material you've reviewed, that it appears that this offence provision was raised only on one occasion over the course of almost a 20-year period? Uh, the specific reference to that, yes. And because you've had the timeline prepared... Yes. And so if you saw language that mirrored this this provision, would you assume that whoever prepared that record may have turned their mind to Section 364? Now, that's a presumption, but it's a reasonable presumption. And if the person turned their mind to Section 364 or the elements of what would constitute an offence, then there was an awareness that there was an option open to police to consider taking action, for example, in relation to cruelty to a child under 16. Yeah. I, Commissioner, I object to this line of questioning. <clears throat> there is a statement of agreed facts. Um, we volunteered statements from various departments to address that and indicative findings. This isn't one of them for a start. It's unfair. This witness has no notice of this line of questioning, nor has he had any opportunity to prepare such as, have you known of anyone charged under it? Uh, with respect, it's not helpful and it's quite unfair to this witness. Well, um, I'm just going, Commissioner, just going to use the detective superintendent's own material. We had agreed on the agreed facts, but the detective superintendent has provided his timeline, which includes some new and additional matters, and I should be entitled to be able to examine him on his own material. Right. So we might go to that material then, Detective Superintendent. Uh, the document, which is attachment one to your statement, it's a table, you see that? So that's Have you a, got the, that? Yes, that's the 2020, uh, yeah, the 2020 timeline. So the 2020 uh, table was prepared shortly after the passing of Paul Barrett where uh, various agencies were reviewing what documents they had. Is Correct. that right? Yes. And was this table prepared as part of the preparation of material to provide to the children, sorry, the Queensland Family and Child Commission for its review? Yes. Did you provide this table? No. Why not? Um, it was never requested and the the QFCC review was in two parts. Uh, so as requested by the Attorney General. So the first one was a systems review in relation to children with disabilities um, during the or wonderful children during the uh, period of COVID. And then the second part was a specific review in relation to this family. Um, that second part of that review never occurred, mm. so uh, we were never required or requested to provide this material. What material did you provide to the QFCC for the systems review? Uh, policy and procedure. And so this table that you prepared was in anticipation of providing information to the board if the board was going to do, undertake a review? No, no. It wasn't? So the... the Prior to um, the Child Death Review Board commencing on the 1st of July, there was, uh, we had a series of reviews conducted by QFCC as directed by the Attorney General. So this was, I think, the third or the fourth one that we were going through. So we were in a pattern of what material would be requested by QFCC. So in preparation for that, I had asked this to be prepared. Right. And you thought it would be helpful to the Royal Commission to see the document that you prepared? I thought it was, yes. All right, so let's go to attachment one. And the table sets out the date, the relevant subject matter, and there's some material there that are covered by the non-publication order. So I'll just use the pseudonyms mm -hmm. for working through this document. Sure. Then there's the action. And then the next column has source. 
and there's a reference there to Q Prime. Yep. And Q Prime is the Queensland Police Records and Information Management Exchange. Correct. And that is a database that commenced operation in June 2007. You're aware Correct. of that? Yes. It replaced the old CRISP system. Correct. And that records that were in the former record management system then were transferred over to Q Prime. Is that right? Correct. And Q Prime operates by the uh, relevant police officers having to record any particular event and that in some cases there's a, a process of filling out template forms in a, I don't know, computerised way. Yep. I can't quite explain that particularly yep. well. But they would pull up on the screen and if, for example, they were attending a domestic violence incident, then they would then code the responses by reference to that particular incident. Is that right? Yes. And are we right in understanding that with respect to the coding for family violence that there is not a particular disability flag? Are you um, aware of that? Are you referring to police referrals or are you referring to um, Q Prime and the occurrences themselves? So there's two parts to this. Yeah. So Q Prime is our primary information system where we record, as you said, events um, and proceedings. Um, normally we're talking about um, offences, uh, list of offences um, and other actions. Um, I, I'm not aware if we have disability because I'm not sure why we would just have disability. There'd be a reason attached to the disability that we'd be attending, so I, I'd expect as an occurrence we would be capturing it under that. Um, under the police referral system, which is how we uh, uh, refer people who need support or request support to um, service providers. That's the police referral system, which sits, uh, is attached to Q Prime. So we can make referrals from Q Prime through police referrals to service providers. Uh, in that system, we don't have um, disability as a specific referral category. What we do have is 22 other categories. Uh, and within those, we can provide information that this person does have a particular disability. All right, so just look at the table you've prepared, mm -hmm. where you've got in the column source and a reference to Q Prime. Yes. Then is the content that's in the column action taken directly from the Q Prime record or is it an e a more edited version? Do you know? Oh, no, it's a summary. A summary. So the Q Prime primary record might have more information in this. Yes, it does. And in terms of preparing this table and what is included in the summary, was that your decision as to what was included in this document? Um, oh, my decision. Well, I'd asked for a summary of each of the events to be recorded, so... So somebody else might have prepared the summary and then you've reviewed it. Well, that's exactly what happened. The next column is said to be Q prime reference number, and you'll see there's a reference number there. Does that mean that if somebody enters the Q prime uh, software system and they want to look up a particular event, they can use that number to identify an event? Correct. But if, for example, they wanted to put in uh, the name Caleb surname, would the Q Prime allow whoever was making the entry or wanting to check earlier entries to be able to identify, say, Caleb by name as either a victim or perpetrator or whoever it might be? I'm just using yeah. that as an example. So it's got multiple search um, capabilities. So you can search under multiple entities. You could do it via a person. Mm -hmm. And if you search via the person, you would see a, uh, a list of all of the occurrences that that person appears in. Um, and there's a short title in the front page, so you can very quickly identify what those occurrences are about. It might, might say ill treatment of child. It might say uh, assault occasion bodily harm. So domestic and family violence. So you could very quickly have a look at that by person. You could also do a search by address. So you could bring up all of the incidents recorded to a particular address and then once you enter each of those incidents, you can see um, the involved people, etc. And in, in the ordinary course, uh, say, for example, police officers were called out to a particular incident at a particular <coughs> address, would there be capacity for the officers to check the queue prime before they went out? 
yes, there's, there's two parts to that one as well. So if it's a, a job detailed by the Police Communication Centre, they um, do checks themselves, provide uh, brief information to the investigating officers, particularly around um, safety concerns, so firearms, etc., violence. Uh, but the officers now with their mobile um, capabilities en route can do checks themselves on Q Prime to inform themselves about um, the address and the people. All right. Now, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to ask you about every event in your table. Thank but you. there's three that I do want to ask you about. So the first one, if you can, again, I don't have page numbers, so I would have to work by date. Yes. But it's the second page of the table, and the, the entry date, commissioners, is 03-03-2010, so the 3rd of March 2010. Have you got that, Detective Superintendent? Oh, I do. Now, the heading here is Offences Against Children, Ill Treatment. Do you see that? Yes. And um, can I summarise it this way? That uh, there was a notification from Caleb and Jonathan's school indicating that Caleb and Jonathan presented at school in poor condition with poor quality food and showing signs of hunger on a, reg on a regular basis. Concern that bowel motions on a regular basis contain foam rubber, possibly from home lounge or mattresses. House is sparsely furnished and has overpowering smells. The boys are often restricted to one room, which has one lounge and very limited toys. The father is said to have some in-home support, but it has stopped for unknown reasons and the boys' health and hygiene has deteriorated. So that's the entry. Now, the language used there, would you agree with me, is the type of language that might pick up the elements of Section 364, cruelty to children under 16, and both boys were under 16 at the time. Do you agree? Yes. This record tells us on the 28th of May 2010... Police attended the family home at about 9.30 at night. Now, and you can help me with this. It says, father denied above allegations and when challenged by police after entering the house and observing issues of neglect, he made excuses or changed his story. So in terms of the record of father denied allegations, but that suggests that when police went to the family home, that the allegations put to the father were the matters that I've just described in the paragraph above. Well, I think that's a reasonable presumption. And I'll just jump down a little bit. It says that the police contacted crisis care. So that's a police acting, and that's part of a referral, is it? Um, crisis care is the after-hours child safety yeah. service and advised an SP4, and that's a particular code used. Yeah, SP4 is a education report to police of child harm. But this was enough to um, require police to say something needs to happen, that the police were able to form a view, may I say, of suspected harm to the children? I think so, is that um, report proceeds on and they talk about um, a temporary assessment order, etc. that is clearly that they have concerns about the safety and well-being of those children. Over the page, the record indicates that the police observed that the children are likely to be lagging in their development more than can be accounted for by their underlying cognitive impairments. The children appear isolated and unlikely to be provided the necessaries, it might be necessities, but it says necessaries of life by mm. their father and police left at 10pm. Yes. The next step was the police contacted after hours child safety and arrangements were made for a, a further attendance the next day to remove the children. Am I right in understanding that that time that the police spent putting the allegations to the father, observing the children and observing where the children were living and their living conditions, 
that police were able to form a view that the children needed to be removed. Yes. And notwithstanding your observation that the police did not have the relevant expertise or responsibilities, this appears to be an instance where the police have been readily able to identify a risk of harm to the children and also identify that action needs to be taken in the form of removing the children. You'd agree with that? So the purpose of removing the children is to allow child safety to make a proper... I'll come back to the purpose. Well, My question is about the capacity of the police to do what's recorded here. You so, accept they were able to well, do that. With respect, the witness was answering the question. It's not fair to cut him off when he was being responsive. Well, I'd ask the witness to be responsive to the question, but I think we're getting there, Commissioner. So I think that there's two points. The assessment of harm sits with the Department of Child Safety. We identify our concerns, and if we believe that those ch children perhaps are at risk whilst the, the assessment is occurring, then we will request, or if we have to, we will take action to remove the children to allow that assessment to occur. Mm -hmm. So that isn't us determining harm. But that there was enough... Make, sorry, a, forgive me for interrupting. But there was enough there for the police on that occasion to say the children need to be removed. For what purpose follows is a different inquiry. My question to you is the police capacity, by their observation, by their engagement with the father, had enough information to decide the children should be removed for whatever purpose or process comes later. You agree with that? For a temporary removal, till an assessment can be okay. conducted. You'll see from the note that the following morning, the police return with child safety, and this is what's said. The environment the children were exposed to was worse in daylight. So the, the father then consented to the children's removal. Correct. Right. If the police had not attended on that occasion... And if the police had not made the assessment that the children needed to be moved immediately, would you agree with me that it's unlikely that there would have been anything else that would have happened around that time that resulted in the children being removed? Um, I, I can't answer that because I, I do okay. not know what child safety knew. Uh, I know that the police were concerned sufficiently to remove, uh, request the removal of the children whilst an assessment occurs. All right. So we know following the, this intervention by the police, the children with the consent of the father were removed for a period of about a week. You're aware of that? Oh, I wasn't... The, the length of time I wasn't aware. Okay. And the last entry here says, and this comes back to my questions earlier about Section 364... It says, to substantiate any offence, medical evidence would be required. So proceedings may be commenced upon a recommendation by SCAN. However, at this stage, the offender is being dealt with by DOCS. Do you see that? It's the last subparagraph. Yes, I do. Now, does that suggest to you that whoever made this entry... He or she may have turned their minds to provision 364 and given consideration to the elements of the offence. You agree with that? Uh, I don't know specifically about 364, but certainly consideration around neglect and care for the children. Well, is there another offence in the Queensland Criminal Code about care and neglect of children? that would constitute uh, an offence? There's multiple offences that could apply. So you have uh, failure to provide necessities of life, mm -hmm. um, uh, endangering a child, um, then you've got the more uh, general offences of torture, deprivation of liberty, uh, assaults, etc. So there are multiple offences that could be considered, not just 364. Mm -hmm. But can I say, stepping back and looking at this intervention in... May 2010, that this was the only time that both Jonathan and Caleb were removed from their parents, or from their father, put aside Caleb's removal as a <coughs> tiny infant. This is the only time 
these children were removed from their father and the living conditions that they were in. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I'm aware of this aware occasion. Of I'm not sure yeah. if they had been removed on other occasions. But occasion. you're not aware. Can I put to you, this is an occasion where the system seems to be working reasonably well. There's a notification from the school. The police act on that notification. The police t attend the residence. The police put the propositions or allegations to the father. The police form a view and exercise judgment. It results in action then being taken with child safety for the removal of the children, as you say, for whatever purpose comes later, an assessment by scan or whatever actions taken. This is an example of the system working well. You agree with that? Yes. And when we look at the entire record, this is the only time. But you're not aware of that, are you? Uh, as in removed from that house, no. Okay. I want to take you to the second example now. So, again... Um, it's over the page. And I think we'll do the uh, example that starts with the entry date of 10-01-2015. Yes. Now, that's described as street check. What does a street check mean? Um... It is where you engage with a person, uh, no particular offence has been identified, but you're recording that you have engaged with that person and the nature of that engagement. And would a street check be done by one or two police officers? It could be done by an individual. Right. So this records that there was a street check and there are a number of people identified, including Caleb and Jonathan, at a camping ground and another camper had raised concerns over the welfare of the children who are, quote, severely disabled. Children could not speak but appeared okay and fed but had poor hygiene and smelt of urine. You see that record yes. there? So can we infer, this is a summary of a, a larger record, but in summary, someone has contacted the police to raise a concern about the welfare of the children Yes. They recognise the children as children with disability. Yes. Then uh, there's been the street check, and the street check has yielded uh, the result of they appeared okay, fed but had poor hygiene and smelt of urine. So that might reflect the observations made by the police officers. Yes. Would you have expected the police officers attending that street check to have reviewed the earlier prime records? Um, possibly. Because if they had reviewed the earlier prime records, if you can go back, they would have seen that on New Year's Eve, on the 31st of December 2014, about 10 days or so mm -hmm. before the camping ground matters, that there had been... a uh, a police attending at the family home at 8.45 on New Year's Eve. Yes. And the police viewed the children who were then asleep in the bedroom, only dressed in nappies, but appeared clean with fresh nappies and seemed well fed. Yes. And the observation <clears throat> made by the police was, and I just dropped down a few lines, door handles on the inside and outside of the bedroom door had been removed so the children were unable to exit the rooms by themselves. The father stated that the door handle had fallen off but police believe it had been removed intentionally to prevent the children from getting out. The kitchen was filthy with open tins of food and dirty dishes, but it appears that the basics are being provided by the children. There is insufficient evidence, I assume that means, to suggest a criminal offence is being committed, but on this occasion, the police also contact docs after hours. Do you see that? Yes. So if 10 days before, 
the street check, the officers had checked the Q prime in relation to the New Year's Eve matter. Do you think that you might have expected the officers to perhaps do a little bit more than simply make an observation that the boys appeared okay? Um, you know, the, the street check may not or does not perhaps summarise all the actions taken by the officers. I, I can't say what they did or didn't do. Well, then moving on, uh, obviously the camping trip continues and by the on the weekend of the 17th through to the 19th of January 2015, you can see that there is recorded in your table a Crime Stoppers report. So Crime Stoppers mean that members of the general public can ring a, a line and report something that they may see or witness. Is that right? Correct. And no doubt Queensland Police take very seriously a report to Crime Stoppers. Yes. And it's um, customary, is it not, that if there is such a report that the police would then attend? No, not necessarily. Not always? No. Crime Stoppers pass on information for all manner of police. Uh, I think drugs is a very common one. If there's insufficient evidence within the crime report or the Crime Stoppers report, then we perhaps will not take action. Okay. If you, you're familiar, aren't you, with the summary that appears for the entry 19-1-2015. It's quite lengthy. Yes. But you've read that? Yes. All right. Can I summarise it this way? I'm not in summarising, not intended to uh, minimise any of this. But it seems that two people who were at, at the same ca campground had observed Caleb and Jonathan. They identified or recognised the young men as intellectually handicapped. That's the expression used. And there was a, a belief that they had been camping for about four weeks. The informant to Crime Stoppers raised the following concerns. The boys being left unsupervised for most of the day, spending most of their time in a tent with temperatures of approximately 35 degrees. The nappies were not changed regularly and smelt very bad. The boys were washed once a day which involves stripping their clothes and nappies off and throwing a bucket of boar water over them. There was no soap, no scrubbing, and then they were dressed in the same clothes. The father fed the boys in the dark at night, and on two occasions, the youngest boy hid behind someone at the campground, but the father grabbed him and on one occasion kicked him very hard up the backside. On the last night the informants were there, they could hear the father laying into one of them. One of the boys was making a noise in a tent, so the father went into the tent and started smacking him loudly. That's the Crime Stoppers report. That would be enough to warrant police to go and follow that up. You agree? Yes, that's what they did. Well, the police then uh, did not make the campground until the 22nd of January. Do you see that? Would there be any reason why it would have taken a number of days? Uh, no, I, I can't answer what demands were in place on the officers at the time or what resources were available to attend. Would you agree with me, looking at the record of the police attendants, that their engagement was with Paul Barrett and there's nothing to indicate that the police spoke to or attempted to speak to the children at all? you agree with that? Um Police observed children to be healthy but were obviously wearing soiled nappies. Yes, they observed so, them, but I'm putting to you that they didn't make any attempt to speak to them. Oh, well, I don't know whether they did or I didn't. It's just because it's not recorded here does not mean that they didn't attempt to speak with them. Unlike the earlier matter that I drew your attention to, there is nothing out here that records the police putting those allegations, which include, would you agree, assault in relation to the children? Kicking someone up the back, back behind, grabbing or slapping, that's an assault, isn't it? Uh, by definition, and you do have to consider domestic discipline as well, but I won't concede. You are not for one second suggesting this is domestic discipline, are you, Detective Superintendent? What I said was you'd have to consider it, but I concede that it could be an assault. You concede that? Mm. If the informant gave information of a, an assault in relation to two children 
identified as young people with intellectual disability, you would expect your police officers to make a thorough investigation, would you not? I'd expect police to uh, make in the appropriate inquiries every time. Looking at the record here, I want to put to you that the response recorded was wholly inadequate given the information provided by the informant. Would you agree with that? No, I disagree. You do? Yep. So even though the police observed the children wearing soiled nappies, they accepted on face value the father's contention that they were changed regularly. That seems to be the effect. I object to that. If, if council wants to put it fairly, which includes over the page, then that is exactly what she should be doing. And that's what she is doing. I'm on the Thank first you. sentence. So you have to repeat that. So police observed children to be healthy but were obviously wearing soiled nappies, which the father stated were changed regularly. And what I put to you is this seems to be the police accepting what the father said. Do you agree with that? Yes. Then the police make an assessment because the family had been camping for three weeks, the children appeared to be in good health. You agree, don't you, that your officers have no relevant expertise, do they, to assess or determine harm? Yeah, we, that's correct. But what we can do is identify our concerns. We have serious concerns in relation to a child through indicia as you raised, then we uh, will report it. Okay. But they don't have the expertise to know whether or not a child is or is not in good health. We have, uh, as everybody does, the ability to make a general assessment or general uh, form a general view. And there's no signs of injuries uh, and it says nil child protection concerns. The father indicated he has support from school. So the conclusion is the police state there's no evidence of a criminal offence, but you've just agreed with me that the informant's information would constitute an assault. That's Do not evidence. Do you agree with that? But, but that's not evidence of an offence. But you agree with me that there's nothing in this record to indicate that the police made any inquiries of Mr Barrett with respect to pulling kids, in, kids into a tent, grabbing them from behind kicking the kid up the backside or laying into them or smacking them loudly. There's nothing to indicate that the police raised that with Mr Barrett. Do you agree with that? There's nothing. Yeah, I do agree, but there's also nothing to say that it wasn't raised with Mr Barrett, and this is a summary of their final outcome or that officer's outcome, which you... he decided there was no um, child protection concerns. So how he formed that opinion... Um, I don't have the evidence in front of me to say what he did or didn't consider. Have you made any inquiries about this particular incident yourself? No, I've not made any inquiries about any of the um, incidents other than mm -hmm. what's contained within the Q Prime reports or other material available. So a desktop exercise is what's occurred. And uh, in terms of this incident, there are no records indicating that this matter was reported to child safety. you agree with that? Yeah, that's correct. If um, no child harm concerns were identified, then there was no requirement under policy or procedure for it to be reported to child safety. Sitting here today, do you accept that the description from the informant clearly identified harm either having occurred or the children being at risk at harm? You'd accept that, wouldn't you? I wouldn't accept that, that it's occurred. What they've described is the potential that it, it did occur. Uh, the officer assessed it and made an informed decision not to report it. All right. Now, uh, Commissioners, I now want to turn to the next matter, which is recorded in the table, but I need to show the Detective Superintendent some material that I can't <coughs> show him other than in a way of uh, disturbing the non-publication orders, and so for that reason I ask that the hearing room be closed. So those who need to leave, they have an early lunch. Yes, so I will ask members of the public to please leave. Those with leave to appear can stay, uh, commissioners obviously, and commission staff. So anyone else, uh, members of the public, please leave, and we will come back shortly. So the Royal Commission is now closed to the people in this room.
The Royal Commission is now in session. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, our next witness is Ms Michelle Bullen from the Department of Seniors, Disability Services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. And Ms Bullen's taking an affirmation. Thank you, Ms Bullen, for coming to the Royal, Royal Commission. We appreciate uh, your forthcoming contribution as well as for the material that you've provided us we're grateful for that preparation. I'm Commissioner McEwen, this is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. The associate who is just to your right will administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. Mr Eastman will now ask you some questions. Thank you. So can I confirm you are Michelle Bullen? Yes. And you hold the role of Executive Director, Inclusion, Programs and Safeguards. Um, sorry, I'll withdraw that. That's the old title, is that right? Yes. And the new title is now Executive Director, Inclusion, Programs and Strategy. Is that right? Yes. And that's um, an office within the Department of Seniors, Disability Services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Yes. I'm sure there isn't an acronym for that, but I might just <laughs> refer to it as the department if that's convenient. Yes. Thank you. You've previously given evidence to the Royal Commission at Public Hearing 31 concerning a vision for an inclusive Australia. Yes. And I think you gave evidence on that occasion about Queensland's actions under Australia's disability strategy. Yes. So today, though, you've prepared a statement for this case study. Have you had an opportunity to read through the statement? Yes. Are there any corrections that you wish to make to the statement at all? No. And are its contents true and correct? Yes. Thank you. And I think the date of the statement is the 5th of May this year. That's yes. right? Yes. So uh, your statement uh, acknowledges that you have read the agreed facts. Yes. And you say at paragraph 14 of the statement that having reviewed the proposed agreed facts, reviewed the document, you confirm that the matters in the agreed facts align with the documents that you've reviewed. Is that right? Yes. So you don't take any issue with the content of the agreed facts to the extent they're relevant to your department? That's correct. Your statement sets out from paragraph 16 to 29 the role of the department in the transition to the NDIS from Queensland Disability Services to the Commonwealth arrangements under the NDIA. And you also, in those paragraphs, speak to K-Lab's transition from May 2016 and Jonathan's transition, also which commenced in May 2016, but as you acknowledge, did not occur before his father's death. Yes. The one question I want to ask you about the transition process is paragraph 28. Could I ask you to turn to paragraph 28? Yes. This um, is in the context of supporting Jonathan to make the, no, I'll use the shorthand expression, uh, the applications necessary to become an NDIA participant. Is that right? Yes. And uh, you say in the statement that the Department of Education provided some information to the NDIA. Is that right? Uh, the Department of Education, yes. There was a number of departments, yes. Now, you've told the Royal Commission in paragraph 28 that your department unsuccessfully attempted to contact Mr Barrett on seven occasions between October 2018 and March 2019 to offer assistance regarding the transition of Jonathan to the NDIS. Yes. The uh, identification of the seven occasions is based on your review of the department's records, is yes. that right? Yes. And is the nature of the attempts to contact the father all either by phone or email? Yes, that's my recollection. I've read those documents. Yeah. There's nothing in the records to indicate that the attempts to contact the father were done at any time in person? 
not in these records, no. And not done through, for example, the school in terms of support through the school processes? So the records I've got relate to the actions that our staff mm -hmm. took. Um, I don't have visibility over the actions that the school might have taken. The transition process, our department facilitated that for the Queensland Government. The Department of Education supplied their data directly to the NDA themselves, whereas we provided our data and Queensland Health's data and other departmental data on behalf of the government, so the education data set was separate. Is there something that triggered uh, the department, your department, making attempts to contact the father in that period, October 2018 to 2019? Yes, so during transition, and it was before my time in the department, but it's been explained to me as a process and there were certainly exchanges of data sets I, between... I know I'm going sorry. very quickly, but... <laughs> sorry, yes, slow I'll slow down, down. please. Thank you. The, the process was our department and the NDIA regularly exchanged data sets. We provided lists of names essentially initially. They then provided us back... Um, if you like, status updates on those clients so we could see where they were in the process of transitioning. So they had a number of statuses um, at different stages in the process. And our regional officers, as transition was occurring on a regional basis, their role was to then review the records we got back to show the, rec the, the clients who hadn't yet complete a transition and to follow up as much as possible with those people directly to assist them if they if we could. Was your uh, department aware that Jonathan's application had in effect been cancelled? There was a number of different statuses that they, yes, and they certainly refer to that um, status of, of access not met in different parts of the reports, the, uh, the database. You've had an opportunity to read the agreed facts. And if you look at the facts relevant to the period October 2018 to March 2019, which is paragraphs 251 to 297, and I just ask you if you've read that. I have read them, yes. And if you look at that period of time, uh, one can't uh, explain the uh, circumstances of non-contact by the father or the young people being away from their home or out of contact. You'd agree with that? From 251 to 25... 251 to 297. 297. Because what I want to put to you is there's quite a lot of activity going on in interaction with child safety, with mm -hmm. education. There was a safety plan put in place during that time and there'd been a notification to Child Safety on the 6th of March 2019, where the NDIS issues have been discussed. That's agreed fact 292. Mm -hmm. So you've read those facts, I have read you? them, yes. Yeah. I don't know them inside I'm out. not asking you to recall the detail, but <laughs> yep. I'm just putting to you that during the period of the seven attempts, it's not that their family was away and that what we can see from the facts is that there was quite a lot of interaction with government uh, different government agencies at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is that uh, at what point does it take for unsuccessful attempts to contact before the department might do something different than just try to contact by phone or email? In this particular case, there isn't any evidence that we did anything other than that. And we had, um, from the notes, we had numbers that weren't correct or were no longer current phone numbers that we were trying um, and I do have read notes where we left messages for um, the father to call back. Um, but in terms of this particular case, there's nothing in the records that suggests we did anything different. I am aware during transition that there were other cases where um, an, an example that was described to me was our staff were asked to stop stalking people because they felt that we'd been harassing them in our attempts to assist them and to follow them. When we saw them in the street, in fact, I was told someone had followed someone in the street and said, can we help you? And they basically said, no, leave us alone. So I am aware that our regional staff did a lot, as much as they could, but obviously it wasn't the same in every case and it would probably depend on the extent to which they had a relationship previously with the, with the family concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the smaller regional areas, there was a close connection. But there, in this particular case, I can't right. see that we did that. Uh, there was no attempt, according to your statement, for the department to contact Jonathan directly? No, not that I'm aware Is of. Is there any reason <clears throat> why there was no attempt to contact him generally? Not at that time, and I'm, I'm not aware of. 
any reason. And if there'd been unsuccessful attempts to contact the father, it would have been open to the department to, to endeavour to make some type of contact directly with the young person. At that time, he was still a child, mm -hmm. um, possibly, yes. All right, so the next uh, matter I want to ask you about is the QFCC review report. Yes. And you've addressed this in your statement from paragraph 30 onwards. You told the Royal Commission that the department cooperated fully with the QFCC review by providing documents, data and confidential information. <coughs> so um, <coughs> what were the circumstances in which you provided confidential information to the QFCC? We've heard some evidence yesterday about the nature of the information that it could obtain. So the information <coughs> that we provided um, was provided in the um, documents that we supplied and it included um, an outline of the policies and procedures and the things that they'd specifically asked for and a copy of those documents. Some of them were publicly available documents, some of them weren't. Um, and then we also provided an extract of, of the transition arrangements and the, and the role that our department played. So was it the transition arrangements particular to the two young people that constituted the confidential information? No, <clears throat> just generally the process that was applied at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So are you able to identify what the, co the nature of the confidential information was? It was confidential in that it wasn't um, information, <coughs> excuse me, that was in the public take, take domain. Take a glass of water. Yeah, sorry. That's why I stuck in my throat. <coughs> it wasn't um, individual records relating to those children. Right. The uh, department itself did not undertake any departmental review and the reason you say is because the department had stopped providing services to the family, is that right? Uh, that certainly would have been one of the reasons at the time. And on the 30, 30th of March 2021, the Attorney General provided a copy of the report to the department or to your minister? To the minister. And then that came to the department? Yes. You say in paragraph 33 that you're aware that the report was provided to the Department of Child Safety, Department of Education, Department of Disability Services and Premier in Queensland. How is it that you know which uh, ministers or departments received the report? I'm just referring to the letter. Yeah, I'm not, I can't honestly say. Um, from the letter, it's not apparent, the covering letter. Um, we certainly had a role in liaising with other agencies around their, um, the actions that they could take in relation to implementing the findings of that report. So we may have discussed it with them. We did invite the Queensland Family and Child Commission to present at a couple of government forums on that, in that regard, and it may be in those discussions. Do you know if the, the report was provided to the police, the Department of uh, Housing? Do you know that? I don't know that, no. Now, you say then to ensure agencies, including Commonwealth agencies, were aware of the QFCC's report findings. Your department arranged for the QFCC to prevent, present its findings to two meetings, one on the 15th of February 2022 and one on the 24th of March 2022. See that? Yes. Now, that's uh, about 11 and, and almost 12 months, respectively, from when you received the report. Uh, given the nature of the findings in the report, why did it take so long to present those findings to relevant um, Commonwealth agencies? I don't, I'm not aware of any specific reason other than those forums are um, quarterly. Yeah, quarterly, I think, at the time. Um, and there's always, you know, the, the process of getting items on the agenda, I guess, is one that requires scheduling. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any... Um, reason other than that in terms of the timing and availability of people to come and present. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Dietman. Ms. Bullen, I'll ask my colleagues now if they have any, any question. Commissioner Ryan. Uh, only one. There's a reference on um, item, uh, so paragraph 43, 
where you've said that they established a new disability advocacy funding program, which commenced on 1st of January. Yes. Um, how extensive is that? Is there many people involved in that or budget or something to give us some idea of its size? Yes, I can do that. Um, so the current budget is $4 million per annum. Currently, we fund 11, 11, let me just quickly count, 12 um, individual services, non-government advocacy organisations to provide advocacy services to people with disability and their families. As a result of the QFCC review, we took the opportunity to review the arrangements we had in place for funding advocacy organisations. And um, as part of that review, we effectively reallocated the funding to make sure that we had statewide coverage and an advocacy organisation in each of the NDIS regions across Queensland. We allocated that money on a, on a population basis, basically based on the size of the regions. We also specifically put aside money and allocated funding for an advocacy organisation to focus specifically on children and young people with disability. And our current provider of that service is Queensland Advocacy Inc. Those services intended for a wider function than simply helping people into the NDIS. Absolutely. So helping, if I yes. was accessing housing, for example, I could yes. use for education if I had a problem. Yes, any any service, whether it's government or non-government, if they need the assistance of an advocacy organisation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Commissioner Mason. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one question. Um, were you able to hear the evidence previous speakers? I have previous listened witnesses? to <coughs> most of it, yes. Um, just in summary, um, all of the witnesses this today uh, indicated areas for improvement around policies and procedures and practices around disability. And we're particularly looking at uh, young people, children with intellectual disability, non-verbal. Um, is that an area that your department could be providing leadership in, in terms of improving knowledge and understanding of practices in those agencies and others that may uh, interact with children, young people with disabilities? Absolutely. Our department does have a lead role as, um, as the department for, among other things, people with disability. We have, as part of that role, um, as we mentioned earlier, we have released the um, Queensland's new disability, disability plan, Together a Better Queensland. We developed that, um, that document to implement effectively Australia's disability strategy. And we did that in collaboration with people with disability, including or facilitated by Queenslanders with Disability Network. Um, as under the, under the, the current legislative regime um, in Queensland, the Disability Services Act requires all government departments to have a disability service plan. So the, the actions across government that um, implement effectively our state plan and the national strategy now are delivered through departments' disability service plans. Um, our department has identified a number of initiatives including um, training, uh, training resources and materials to support other government departments working with people with disability. We also um, help other government departments where they need advice. We've got um, the Queensland Disability Advisory Council is a ministerial advisory council that provides advice specifically to government on issues relating or impacting on people with disability. And that council is largely made up of members of people with disability. And um, so we can facilitate if government departments have seek need information, advice, they can do it through that forum. Um, I think, does that answer your question? Yeah. And what's, what struck, struck me <laughs> was um, as leaders in their departments, uh, the acculturation of disability and best practice to wasn't front of mind. So, um, yeah, really hope that as yeah. your agency takes the lead that there's not just um, a, a one-way flow of information but there's a way of monitoring and checking that best practice actually is being acculturated in these agencies. Absolutely. And the, and the disability, the, the, the new state disability plan, which I do have a copy of here, um, we're treating that as effectively a call to action for not just government but non-government organisations as well to, to step up and play their part in creating a, a truly inclusive Queensland and that is our hope. We will also be reporting on progress and um, the Australia's Disability Strategy Outcomes Framework will be a good um, starting point for measuring 
how outcomes are being achieved. Our, the committee, the, the working group of, of people with disability who advised us in the development of this, um, this new plan were very clear that the, the things that they, um, we, we call them building blocks, but the fundamental basics, if you like, that need to be in place to really drive that change um, in culture is um, there, there are four, I guess, four elements to it. One is co-design, and we refer to co-design, but we, what we really mean is, I heard you mention earlier in the hearings, um, nothing about us without us, and that is really what we're about, um, having people with disability at the table when decisions are being made. Um, so I'm flicking through trying to find the right section. Well, but it might be more helpful if we provide that in yes, writing or we can do that and in, in the material, then we can perhaps yep. provide it. I'm conscious of time. Did you Absolutely. want to add yeah. uh, wrap no, up your answer? No, that's fine. We're happy to provide it. It's on, it's on our website as well, Thank but we're happy much. to provide it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just a one quick follow-up question from what Commissioner Mason was, at, was asking. And Commissioner Mason has asked other witnesses about their understanding of human rights more broadly, such as a, a term for you, ableism, uh, intersectionality, dignity, and et cetera. I'm not going to ask you what your view is, but I want to know what are the challenges in getting the public service to have a common understanding and common knowledge what are the gaps? And perhaps give me a few quick brief um, uh, points on that. What are the challenges? I think the starting point is, is awareness and understanding. And um, certainly for our department, we have one of our mandatory training modules for all our new starters is a disability awareness online training module. And we promote that to staff um, regularly and we you know, encourage people to, to refresh their training. And I think um, part of understanding that people people with disability, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, First Nations people are primarily people, first and foremost, and have the same rights to, to, to human rights and dignity as anybody else. The Disability Services Act sets that out, and that's that's existed long before the Human Rights Act, but those, those human rights principles have been, I guess, front and centre of what we've been doing for a long time now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. We appreciate uh, the uh, information you've given us. Uh, how do you leave to appear, Ms. M Ms. McMillan? Um, Commissioner, I mentioned to Council Assistant earlier that Ms. Bullen would like to give some evidence about the transition and how they work with the service providers for the young men. What she proposed, and we're happy to do, is put that in writing, given particularly the time. I think that sounds very sensible, given the time constraint we seem to be under at the moment. So, yeah. thank you. Anything else? No, my Anything? witness be excused. Yes, thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you again, Ms Bullen. You are yes. excused. Ms Eastman. Uh, the next witness, next witness is Mr Tracy, and Ms Marnie will take his evidence. Chair, Mr Tracy will be taking an oath. Thank you. Mr Tracy, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission. We very much appreciate your forthcoming evidence and for the information you've given us. I'm Commissioner McEwen, this is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. Uh, the Associate, who's just to your right, will read out the oath. Thank you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Ms. Marnie, thank you. Uh, your name is Frank Tracy. That's correct. Uh, and you are the Health Service Chief of the Children's Health Queensland Hospital and Health Service. That's correct. You've provided a statement for this Royal Commission, and it was signed on the 9th of May uh, 2023, so I think yesterday. I have, that's correct. Uh, and I assume that you read it before signing it? Yes, I did. And you were satisfied that it was true and correct? I am. Uh, have you read it since signing it, and is there anything that you want to change in it? 
No, I'm satisfied with the statement as is. Thank you. I understand you have a copy of that statement in front of you. I do. Uh, in terms of uh, what you relied upon, if I can just take you to paragraph three of your statement, uh, you say that you've read and understood the proposed statement of agreed facts, uh, the indicative finding, and that you've also reviewed the health-related source information referred to within those documents as they relate to Queensland Health. Yes, I have. Uh, in your statement, you've uh, referred to a number of documents and you've adopted the uh, Royal Commission's numbering system. Yes. And so, for example, if I take you to paragraphs seven, uh, six and seven, uh, you'll see there are uh, footnotes also uh, at six and seven, and they refer to documents that you've read. Is that right? That's correct. And so any document that appears as a footnote is a document you've accessed yes. and you've read. Yes. Uh, and you, there's nothing about what you've read that would suggest to you that the documents are not accurate reports of what was taken at that time. That's correct. Uh, did you read or rely on anything else in preparing your statement? Uh, similarly, uh, the, the proceedings, uh, summary of the proceedings on a daily basis in terms of um, um, what was being discussed. So, you, so you've been uh, kept up to date as to what's been happening this week? Yes. Uh, and you understand the core uh, messages and themes that have been coming through in the evidence as well? Yes, I do. Uh, at paragraph five of your statement, you refer to uh, young person one and young person two. Yes. And you understand that uh, young person one is uh, referred to as Caleb in these proceedings and young person two is referred to as Jonathan. Yes, I do. I want to take you to a couple of matters in your statement. The first one is the scan meetings that you refer to, uh, which is at paragraph five uh, of your statement. Specifically, the scan meetings that are described at paragraph, uh, subparagraph E. You say at subparagraph E, there was a meeting of scan on 3 December 2018 and that was regarding Jonathan, resulting from a notification by a member of the public in November 2018, and then referral by DCS, uh, being a reference to child services. Correct. Uh, and the scan determined to further review the matter on 14 January 2019, uh, and a further meeting did occur on 14 January. That's correct. In terms of the agreed facts, and uh, this is, uh, you don't have a copy of the agreed facts in front of you, but I'll just read it out to you. Uh, paragraph 272 uh, refers to uh, a scan meeting uh, that was held on the 8th of November. Uh, I withdraw that, that there was a uh, meeting that, uh, I'll start again. On 14 January 2019, CPA scan held a meeting relating to Jonathan's care. The Department of Child Safety informed participants it had completed its IA of the 8 November 2018 notification and determined it was unsubstantiated. Now, the meeting, though, that is not referred in that is the meeting of... Uh, I'll just get back to it, the meeting of 3 December 2018. And at that particular meeting, uh, and this is at paragraph 263 of the agreed facts, the meeting documented, Paul Barrett informed the Department of Child Safety he had broken up with his partner and he believed that she had made a vexatious complaint. Uh, Paul Barrett informed the Department of Child Safety he had a large network of friends. He has an advocate that used to help, uh, used to work at the school, and he also spoke about having a friend that helps him to come and clean. Uh, and Caleb and Jonathan's rooms at home too were completely bare. Uh, Paul Barrett had a blown up mat had blown up mattresses, and at the CPA scan, this is at paragraph 264. Uh, the Department of Education informed participants that it, in, that it considered Paul Barrett may be minimising Jonathan's seizures 
which may be worth following up. Queensland Health informed participants Jonathan was last seen for seizures in April 2018. However, he didn't attend in October 2018 and his next appointment is in April 2019. And so there was a health participant informing parties of relevant medical matters relating to Jonathan, correct? Correct. That meeting identified two factors that could, on one reading, present uh, concerns as to neglect. Do you agree with that? And maybe I'll go through what those two factors are. That would be helpful. Thank you. The discussion about... Uh, Caleb and Jonathan's rooms at home too were completely bare, so no furnishings. Mm -hmm. uh, young people in a completely bare room, no furnishings, no bed, no cupboard, that uh, may speak to neglect, mightn't it? Yes, I agree. Uh, the fact that the school expressed a concern that Paul Barrett may be minimising Jonathan's seizures which may be worth following up, that uh, is an expression of potential neglect, isn't it? It would be a concern and it could be considered as neglect. Part of the role of the scan was to take those concerns on board, wasn't it? Correct. And part of the role of scan was to follow up on concerns of potential, for example, neglect, correct? Correct. In fact, those medical issues should not have to wait until April 2019, after the next SCAN meeting, to be followed up, correct? If those matters were deemed serious by the medical participants in the SCAN meeting, uh, they would likely be referred back to the Paediatric Health Services and followed up. Yes. Uh, do you con you'd agree, though, wouldn't you, that uh, where Queensland Health say Jonathan has not been seen for seizures, what, sorry, was last seen for seizures in April 2018 and had not attended the next appointment, that is of itself a sufficient concern to follow it up before the next SCAN meeting, isn't it? It may not be. It depends on the individual case and the nature of the seizures and the severity of those mm -hmm. and how they impact on the child's life. Mm -hmm. I but, can't comment in detail about the particular case. But you would not know that unless you followed it up, correct? Uh, you may know it in the initial stages after doing uh, the initial assessment and treatment. And the fact that he was due for a, another follow-up would indicate that he needed to be assessed further in terms of his well-being. So it was sufficient to wait to see if he would turn up in April 2019 for the purposes of the SCAN meeting? That would indicate to me that uh, there wasn't a significant concern about uh, his seizure activity. My question is, though, for the purposes of SCAN, SCAN being a body set up specifically to protect against neglect, correct? Correct. Uh, the fact that a young person with a history of seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, mm -hmm. uh, hospitalisation mm -hmm. for seizures, it ought to, SCAN ought to have the medical representative follow up on the concern expressed by the Department of Education, correct? That's a reasonable uh, conclusion. Yes. Uh, the meeting on the 14th of January, and if I can take you to the agreed fact, I'll read that out. It's at 272. Uh, the participants... The Department of Child Safety informed participants that the November notification seemed like quite a malicious notification. Paul Barrett managed the care of Caleb and Jonathan quite well. And Child Safety Officer thought Paul Barrett was doing his, quote, absolute best and, quote, loved Caleb and Jonathan. That is not the test to determine whether someone is being subject to uh, neglect, is it? That someone loves them and they're doing their best? Certainly not from a health perspective. And as a health representative on SCAN, it was incumbent on that person to draw attention 
to what the appropriate focus of the SCAN meeting should be, correct? That would be a reasonable assumption to make. Uh, the SCAN meeting showed no records of uh, any inquiries made uh, into the medical matters in the follow-up period, correct? Correct. And there was no focus at all in that follow-up meeting on how uh, Caleb and Jonathan had travelled in that interim period, correct? If that has not been recorded, I, I would just like to say, if I may, that uh, the uh, health participation in the SCAN process is to provide expert advice and, and support to the process. Uh, so if it's not recorded specifically in there, that wouldn't necessarily mean that uh, those conversations have not taken place. Is that a deficit in the process if, if that is what is occurring? If that expertise and expert opinion for at least a moment in time reflecting on something serious enough to bring it to a scan is not being documented. Do you agree that reflects a deficiency in the scan process? I, I certainly agree that it's a uh, distinct opportunity for improvement in that process. It would certainly facilitate a more integrated conversation and um, and allow new members of SCAN to look back and be fully and properly informed as to what past SCAN participants ex had examined and views expressed. I think that's very reasonable. Uh, given that, is that something that you would look into um, following this hearing in terms of making more robust those SCAN processes to ensure that type of information is captured and, and documented? I would respond to that by saying yes, uh, simply, and uh, it will be a, a welcomed opportunity, anything that we can do to strengthen our process uh, to support uh, children who are in distress or in peril is a, a good thing to do. In terms of uh, the provision of clinical care to Caleb and Jonathan, you addressed that uh, at paragraph seven of your statement. Yes. And you say at that statement that, to the best of your knowledge, you believe that the provision of clinical care to Caleb and Jonathan was of a high quality. Yes. So when we're talking about clinical care, are we talking about the physical engagement and examination of the client, the patient? Yes, that's what we're talking about. So, for example, if uh, one of these... Um Young people or children uh, turned off to our AED department or an outpatient uh, appointment that we have been thorough and um, clear in our treatment and that that treatment will be followed up accordingly. Mm. So that uh, requires, as part of that clinical care process, carrying out appropriate investigations. Absolutely. Uh, making appropriate diagnoses where available. Yes. Uh, following up with the uh, patient, the client? Yes. Uh, developing relationships with the patient and where they are uh, a child or a young person or a person who's unable to advocate independently, uh, a person who supports them in uh, their life. From a person-centred care perspective, the focus is always on the child or the young person. However, in, in paediatric health care, the engagement with the family or the carer or uh, agencies who are supporting that child or young person is critical in terms of their care and treatment. And where does the, in that clinical care process, where, for example, there are concerns about the capacity of that carer to adequately or appropriately engage in the process, where does the child or young person's focus or voice get heard? How does it get heard? That depends on the individual case. So it may be that uh, an advocate is um, engaged by the clinical service. Uh, it may be that uh, a member of the extended family is engaged. It depends on the individual circumstances of that family and that child. And in terms of Caleb and Jonathan's situation, did... Uh, the Department of Health or Hospitals 
take any steps to ensure that they had an, a voice independent of Paul Barrett? Uh, my response to that would be it will be unusual for uh, our paediatric services not to have explored those alternatives. And uh, that will be done. The mechanism for doing that will be through child protection, our child protection team and forensic team, and that the initial conversations around that will go to the scan process. So again, it relies upon the integrity of the scan process uh, meeting a, I withdraw that. Uh, if, if we go back, it depends upon um, the position of the child or the young person uh, being engaged with the hospital? In, in cases where children are flagged at being at risk or there is a suspicion that they're at risk, that's the mechanism. In instances where uh, children uh, who have parents who at times may disagree with a particular approach, uh, that's usually resolved through engagement with the parents or the parents' uh, broader network or even, even their legal team on occasion. It's, it's solely case dependent. Uh, when you talk about the clinical care of Caleb and Jonathan in your statement, you rely upon the footnotes that I took you before uh, at footnotes six and seven. I'm just going to take you to a couple of those uh, documents now. Uh, the footnote that ends with uh, the second one on uh, footnote six, sorry, footnote seven, the first one on footnote seven, uh, ending in 0033.0002. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a document relating to Caleb, and it documents each of the attendances at the hospital uh, to, for the duration of his life up to 2000, uh, 2020. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, once... Caleb was not in the care of the, uh, in, in foster care. Uh, does it surprise you that on the 9th of August 2002, there was a failure to attend an appointment uh, with the audiology? There was a general paediatrics child advocacy service on the 22nd of October 2002, where there was a failure to attend. There was another audiology failure to attend on the 3rd of February 2003, and if one goes through this document, there are repeated non-attendances. You're aware of that, aren't you? Yes, I am. 2004, failed to attend general pa uh, paediatrics on a number of occasions. 2005, failed to attend on four occasions. That's correct. How can, and you, you accept, don't you, that putting aside emergency attendances where uh, uh, Caleb's been brought in for other purposes, mm -hmm. there was very little and very irregular engagement by Caleb through his father at the hospital, correct? Correct. So on that basis, you would have to agree, wouldn't you, that there could not have been clinical care being provided to Caleb because he could not be seen, he wasn't being seen, he wasn't being examined, he wasn't being diagnosed, all those indicia that you spoke of, of clinical care. I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I'll put it another way. If someone is simply not attending appointments, you're not mm -hmm. providing clinical care, are you? Well, that's that's correct. However, within the context of providing clinical care, uh, parents and uh, children and young people often do not attend appointments for a whole variety of reasons. And In this instance, uh, if this young person wasn't uh, and, and didn't attend appointments, we do have in place processes that would follow up. Our social workers would have followed up. Uh, etc. And uh, those issues then in relation to these young boys' care would have been flagged through the scan process. Uh, but the point being that uh, in your statement, 
you say that uh, there was a high quality provision of clinical care to yes. both of them. That's correct. But they simply did not attend the hospital on a sufficient basis to be able to be provided with any continuity of clinical care, correct? Continuity is quite a different matter, but in terms of their attendance at the hospital, I'm confident that the care that these children and young people received was of a high quality. Uh, they had never received a medical diagnosis, had they, prior uh, to Paul Barrett's death? I can't comment on that. If, if that was the case, that would indicate that one of those indicia of high quality clinical care has not been met, correct? I can't comment on that. It's an inference that you draw. Yeah. In terms then of the independent review that was undertaken by the Queensland uh, Family and Child Commissioner, you refer to that at page 18 of your statement. Uh, and at, at page 18, you talk of there being uh, two reviews being conducted. Uh, a review conducted by the Child Death Review Board and a review conducted by the Family and Child Commission, correct? Correct. Uh, where did you form the view that there were two reviews undertaken? Uh, the, uh, my understanding is, as we worked through the paperwork, that that indicated that there were two reviews that were either undertaken or at least one of them was planned to be undertaken while the other one was undertaken. Well, there's a difference between one being planned to be undertaken and one being undertaken, correct? I accept that. Yes. And are you aware that the Child Death Review Board did not and has not undertaken any investigation uh, into the circumstances of Caleb and Jonathan? No, I was not aware of that. Right. In terms of the fact that no particular uh, a review has been conducted into the individual circumstances of Caleb and Jonathan, is that not a matter that, uh, I withdraw that, does that not mean there are still systemic issues that may be floating about that impact on the provision of care by hospitals to those now adults that have gone missed? If I understand your um, your assertion correctly, uh, yes, I agree. I think there is uh, room for improvement in how we are connected across the system, and uh, particularly for children and young people who are vulnerable, as is the case with these two young men. Uh, and in that regard, given particularly the concession you've appropriately made about some of the deficiencies in the scan process, and knowing now as well that a review into the individual circumstances mm -hmm. of Caleb and Jonathan have not been conducted, do you consider that uh, it would be of benefit uh, to, the ch uh, to health, to Children's Hospital to undertake, or to your department at least, to undertake a review now? I I would consider that, being, that a review would be helpful because uh, the outcome of any review uh, should be uh, to teach us lessons about how to improve the things that we do and improve our approach. Um, I don't believe in this instance that it is specifically a matter for help to conduct a, an overall review, but I do uh, believe that we could contribute to a systems review in the way that we're doing now. And, and you'd certainly agree, based on all the evidence that you've read now, that Caleb and Jonathan uh, came to the attention of the hospital in circumstance where there was signs of neglect and abuse present? At a very early age, and the, the record would support that, uh, in fact, at birth. Uh, and suggest to you that the absence of continual attendances or non-attendances was indicative of ongoing neglect? That may not necessarily be the case. I can see that uh, with the benefit of hindsight in this case, uh, that is true. But in other circumstances, often, for one reason or another, families move uh, 
frequently. And um, that's certainly, though, one of the reasons why there would be utility in conducting a re review to ensure there are no gaps. Uh, so clients and patients and young people like Clay Caleb and Jonathan are not missed. Oh, I would agree. And do you also accept that uh, had there been uh, greater follow-up uh, and contact between uh, your, your, your department of the health services and Caleb and Jonathan, it may well and probably would have prevented uh, the continuation of the circumstances of neglect those young men were found in? I can't say that for certain. Uh, it's likely, though, isn't it? Having uh, professionals engaging with young people through a medical lens, they would have been alert to circumstances that would have prevented uh, the, the young people presenting to hospital with a severe malnutrition uh, on the 27th of May 2020. I think anything that we can do to prevent uh, distress and uh, jeopardy to children is an, is an important thing for us to consider how we go about that. Yeah. Uh, Your Honour, that's, um, there, uh, as Chair, they're the questions that I have. Um, I'm just note, uh, we're quite pressed for time in terms of questions. Thank you, Ms Marnie. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions, and if they do, we'll keep them, we'll try and keep them brief. Commissioner Mason? No. Commissioner Ryan? No. Well, thank you. No questions from me. Thank you very much, Mr Tracy, for your contribution. We're very grateful. You may now be excused. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Eastman, what next? Uh, there's one witness, uh, Chantel Rain from the Department of Communities, Housing and Digital Economy, and that will be the final witness. I understand she's taking an affirmation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Rain. Uh, we're very grateful that you've come to uh, provide us with your evidence and for the material that, you, that you've given us. I'm Commissioner McEwen. This is Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Ryan. The associate who you can see just to your right will read out the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Ms. Thank Eastman. you. Um, Ms. Rain, thank you for joining us. Can I confirm that you are Chantel Rain? I am. I might just keep your voice up. I am. Thank you. And you are the General Manager, Service Delivery within the Housing and Homelessness Services within the Department of Communities, Housing and Digital Economy? Yes, I am. You prepared a statement in relation to this case study on the 5th of May. Yes, I did. Have you had a chance to read the statement? Yes. Are its contents true and correct? Yes. Now, in the time I have available, which is yes. less than six minutes, I just really want to get to two substantive points. Okay. The first is, are the Royal Commissioners right in understanding that the perspective from your department is that you have no mandatory reporting obligations? Uh, that is correct. There are no mandatory reporting obligations. So when it comes to uh, staff who work within the department who may be required to attend premises to affect repairs, to do cleaning work or broader maintenance work, if those staff see circumstances that might uh, indicate a child who has experienced violence abuse or neglect, or at risk of any significant harm, the department's position is there's no obligation on the staff member to report those circumstances. Is that right? The department's position uh, is that um, those types of matters do need to be escalated and discussed with um, senior managers uh, within 
within the staff member's workplace. Within the within the department, not outside yep. the department. Within the department, who then work um, with the staff member and then they um, look at um, further escalation in combination with that staff member, which may mean that they um, uh, refer to other agencies and, um, and also undertake reporting uh, to services such as the Queensland Police Service and um, Child Safety. And who ultimately decides that, the most senior person at the end of the reporting line? Uh, it's actually um, within the workplace, within the operational team. Um, so we encourage our staff to work in combination um, with uh, other managers within their team. Um, the staff member can, in, in their own right, um, make contact, but we do encourage in, in a supportive fashion for them to um, work with with senior managers within their team. And you accept that the uh, staff of the Department of Housing uh, may have some unique opportunities to actually go inside the homes of people. You agree with that? Yes, I do agree with that. And while you've said in your statement that one doesn't make a judgment of the state of somebody's home on one visit, mm -hmm. would you agree with me that there may be some indications on some occasions that the state of a person's home might give rise to a risk of neglect, particularly if there are children in the home? Yes, I do. So if, for example, there were no handles on the door, there were gates, that there was the smell of faeces, that there were piles of clothes with maggots, uh, maggots in food and piles of clothes with bugs, there were stains, there was a smell, those would be the sort of indicators that your, your staff would say, this might be a problem? Yes, that's correct. And um, those are the indicators and some of the indicators that uh, we do expect staff to then um, uh, seek further assistance and support um, through their workplace and um, also through to other agencies. So, uh, yes, they, they have um, uh, undertaken training and um, have been provided with a range of um, programs that help them to now gauge um, or to pick up on signals within the home. And they do have access to a uh, specialist response team within our broader service delivery team that they can also see, and this is a team of mm. specialist staff that um, specialised in, specialise in um, areas such as domestic, family and sexual violence, as well as um, people with disabilities, et cetera. So they have the ability to um, reach in and um, the expectation today in practice is that they would be working and would be seeking other supports. If they do walk into a house and um, are uh, seeing those types of things that you've described. And uh, you're aware from reading the proposed agreed facts that there were many occasions where staff from the Department of Housing had the opportunity to see both the outside of the boys' homes and also inside. Is that right? Yes, I am. And it, and it wouldn't have mattered whether or not the boys were there or not for those staff to make an assessment about the living arrangements. You'd agree with that? Uh, yes, that's correct. And uh, after Paul Barrett's death, there was an officer within the department who undertook a review of the department's documents to identify if there may have been opportunities that the Department of Housing staff might have brought to the attention of child safety or other relevant agencies. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, the area manager at the time. And in terms of uh, that review, uh, is it your position that it's not a reliable review or is your position that that review constituted a proper and appropriate response in the circumstances of Paul Barrett's death and the condition in which the two young men were found? What's uh, your position? In, in my view, uh, that was a informal review that was undertaken by the area manager of the uh, Housing Service Centre at the time. Um, and it was a review which was looking over a short period of time um, and was primarily uh, focused on trying to draw out the relevant information, which was then to um, allow us to be able to act um, 
in a way that had as much information as possible available to us to um, respond and uh, look at alternative housing assistance for right. um, Caleb and John. So you're saying Caleb the purpose of that review was to look for alternative housing for the two young men rather than returning to a house that you knew would require a significant deep clean to make it habitable for them. Is that right? Um, no. What, what I am saying is that the purpose of the review um, was to look at um, what information we did have available to us in regards to the, the property, the tenancy, um, and it did uh, form some of the information that then uh, we considered when we moved into the stage of looking and working with a range of agencies, including the NDIA, in relation to um, suitable accommodation options. But you're not you're not saying to the Royal Commission that you're critical of your own department's review, are you? Um, what I am saying to the Royal Commission is that um, I have looked across the extensive um, records of the tenancy of um, uh, Mr Barrett, and that's from 2004 to 2020. Um, that has, and I am acknowledging that there are occasions where our um, staff um, uh, did come in contact with information um, through Mr Barrett at the time that in current times and uh, practice, uh, the expectation would be that they would have sought out further assistance and looked to potentially other other agencies and um, and other forms of assistance. Um, and so that is what I am acknowledging, that there were occasions across that time period where, um, where uh, the actions could have been that they sought further advice and that they came across information via Mr Barrett in terms of what he communicated to, um, to our staff. Uh, that could have meant that they could have sought additional assistance. So that, that's a type of information that could have been brought to the attention of child safety or the police. You accept that? Uh, yes, there and are there are there are some occasions uh, yep. where there is information that could have been brought to the attention yep. so of yes. child safety. Yes. And you accept that given the unique circumstances of Department of Housing staff being able to go into the property that the Department of Housing staff can play a role in ensuring the safety and the protection of children. You accept that? I do. And um, in current practice, that is very much um, the case. And uh, it is very much uh, what we have done uh, over the recent uh, number of years in terms of investing in building our staff's capability. Yeah, so, so I'm sorry to jump jump in. I know we're short on time, but I just wanted you to answer my question of whether you agreed that there was a role for the, the department. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms Lane, for your yes. contribution. I'll just quickly check with my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Sure. Commissioner Ryan? Look, I do, but I don't. I think we've covered it, so I won't um, okay. press yep. it. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Mason? No, thank you. Oh, well, thank you again, Ms Rain. We're very grateful for your appearance. It, um, I know time time constraints. We would have liked to have had more time. However, we're under some time constraints. I'll just check with the party would leave to appear if there are any questions. Ms McMillan? No. Okay. Uh, you may be. You may be. Um, thank you. Excuse. Uh, Yes, so two things. We don't require Ms. Uh, Dr Crawford, um, and if she has remained, we're grateful that she has remained, but she doesn't require to return to the witness box. That's the first thing. The second is we started this hearing by saying it must remain person-centred and that while we would talk a lot about Caleb and Jonathan, we have to remember that this hearing is about them. And so uh, we've been asked to share with you, commissioners, and those following the hearing, uh, a little message from one of the young men who would like us to show this photo. That's one photo, and I think then there's one more. 
they'd like us to tell you that they're continuing on their journey and that this photo represents the continuation of their journey and looking forward to the future. Commissioners, that concludes the evidence for this case study. What remains outstanding, Commissioners, are the proposed directions. Commissioner McEwen, I know you have a copy of the directions. It's agreed with the exception of one matter. Uh, I understand that our learner friends from Queensland would like additional time with respect to proposed order one. In our respectful submission, if there is an extension of time in relation to proposed order one, that will have implications for the whole of the timetable. Uh, we are acutely aware that the Royal Commission is coming to an end and that the timeframes in which we have available to complete submissions, consider submissions in reply, and for the commissioners to prepare a hearing report following this hearing are so tight that the extension of five days would uh, create a jeopardy to the whole of the timetable. So I appreciate our learner friends' concern, but in my respectful submission, the date should remain as they are. Uh, Commissioner McEwen, you may wish to hear from Ms McMillan, but otherwise I understand the balance of the directions are agreed. Yes, well, obviously, in, in order, we have then two working days left to be able to ascertain any information on notice. It is a very short time. Um, if it's not Friday, then at least uh, perhaps Wednesday next week, so that we can just have a few more days to marshal information. Ms Eastman, do you want can to I, reply to that? Can I make a suggestion that we keep the uh, directions as they are, and that if on Monday a learner friends have difficulty meeting that, or if there's some outstanding matters, that they can bring that to the attention of the Office of Solicitor Assisting, and arrangements can be made as to uh, what any relevant extension might be. Ms McMillan, do you have a, have a response? That. Now, I just want to clarify, I think it's three working days that you have. I assume it will be 5 p.m. on Monday, so tomorrow, Friday, and then Monday, mm. with three working days, I think, given our yes. circumstances. And I can stress to you the get very tight deadlines. However, do you want to respond to that last comment? No. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. Uh, anything else from the other parties before I read them out? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will now read out the directions for this public hearing, 33. One, any witness who put questions on notice during this hearing should provide their answers in writing to the Office of the Solicitor, Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission by Monday, 15th of May, 2023. The answers should be targeted and concise and not address additional or unnecessary matters. Two, by Monday 22nd of May 2023, Council assisting the Royal Commission will provide a list of any additional documents she wishes to tender into evidence, including responses to questions on notice on a confidential basis to the party with leave to appear at this hearing. Three, Parties with leave to appear should advise the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by Friday 26th of May 2023 if they wish to suggest any additional documents for tendering by council assisting. At the same time, they should identify any parts of those documents that they consider need to be redacted before the documents are made public. Four. Council assisting will tender those documents into evidence which she considers appropriate in chambers by Tuesday 30th of May 2023. Five, council assisting the Royal Commission will prepare written submission following the hearing. By Friday 2nd of June 2023, these submissions will be provided on a confidential basis to parties with leave to appear for this hearing and any other individual, entities or organisation council assisting the Royal Commission considered to have a substantial interest in this hearing. Sixth and final, any responses to the council assisting submission should be sent to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by Friday 23rd of, of, 23rd of June 2023. Those responses should be concise and should not include 
any additional evidence. So that concludes the direction. Ms. Eastman, are there any other matters before I make some closing remarks? Um, no, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council. Uh, on behalf of the Commissioners, I express our appreciation to all those who have been responsible for preparing and conducting the hearing. The preparation for these hearings requires a great deal of time, resources and skill. Every person who has engaged with the Royal Commission has brought invaluable information to the hearing. We would like to thank them all personally for their contribution. We were unable to hear from Caleb and Jonathan, the young men who were the focus of the hearing. We do appreciate that closing, the closing remarks from Ms Eastman uh, and the message that they passed on. We were particularly assisted by Lisa Hare, a friend of the young men. We thank her for coming to the Royal Commission and providing us with the insight into Caleb and Jonathan's life prior to their father's death. Her evidence was incredibly important to keeping Caleb and Jonathan at the centre of the issues discussed during the course of this hearing, in circumstances where we were unable to hear from them themselves. Alexis from Service Provider A, A told us about the services and support now received by Caleb and Jonathan, their activities and their plans for the future. Scott McDougall, Queensland Human Rights Commissioner, told the Royal Commission about the operation of the recently introduced Human Rights Act in Queensland in January 2020. The Act imposes obligations on public authorities to make decisions and act consistently with human rights. Thank you to all the representatives from the various Queensland departments and the NDIA who came to give it to give it evidence this week. We are always grateful for their cooperation with the Royal Commission and for the information provided, provided in written and oral form during the course of the week. Thank you also to their legal representative from Queensland and the Commonwealth. We acknowledge the work that, ha that has been involved from their end in preparing and responding to the hearing. We thank them for their cooperation. Preparing for and conducting each public hearing has required an enormous effort for many people. Ms Kate Eastman, AMSC, and Gillian Marnie, Council Assisting the Royal Commission, have done a superb job gathering and presenting evidence for this hearing. Council has been very ably assisted by Kate Dobby's team from the Office of the Solicitor Assisting, who have done an enormous amount of essential background work in compiling and analysing information from a variety of sources, liaising with witnesses and assisting in presenting the information. We thank the counselling team for providing dedicated support to witnesses who have appeared in this hearing. We also thank and appreciate the work of the corporate team, including logistics and information technology. We also thank the interpreters and the critical role they play in the accessibility of the hearing. Uh, thanks also to Law in Order for the technical support they have provided. It is a great credit to them that the hearing has proceeded as smoothly as it has and as so many other hearings held by the Royal Commission. While this hearing has been presented as a case study and witnesses have given evidence specific to the case study, the evidence we have heard is important more broadly. The case study highlighted the importance of, of taking a life course approach to examining the experiences of people with disability from infancy, childhood, adolescence, and as young adults, and their intersecting experiences with various departments. Life course approaches consider the timing of influences, events, and experiences over a person's life. It highlights that experiences during key transition periods can have particularly significant impact on life outcomes. For people with disability, this life course approach highlights that their life experiences can be enhanced or restricted by the institution and organisations they interact with. So thank you again to everybody. While today marks the conclusion of our substantive hearing programme, 
The Royal Commission will remain very busy between now and when it delivers its final report to the Governor-General in just under five months' time. Over the next few months, the Royal Commission will continue with its What Australia Told Us information session, which aims to inform people with disabilities, their families, carers, advocates and other stakeholders, stakeholders about the Royal Commission's work over the past four years. Face-to-face -face events have been held in Brisbane, Sydney, Canberra and Perth so far. Remaining sessions will be held in Darwin on 16th of May, Alice Springs on the 18th of May, Melbourne on 13th of June, Adelaide on the 15th of June and virtually on the 19th and 22nd of June. Members of the public can register to attend these sessions by following the link on our, on our website. The session provide information to the community on what we have done over the course of our inquiry, including how people have engaged with us, who we heard from, ways people shared their experiences, and what we learned from people who participated in engagement, private session, and submission. In addition, over the next few months, the Royal Commission will hold its last lot of private session for those who registered prior to registration closing at the end of 2022. Once concluded, nearly 1,800 members of the Australian public will have engaged with us through the private session process. In terms of other work, the Royal Commission has a number of research reports which it will publish between now and August 2023, and we will look to publish, publish a report of this hearing, Public Hearing 33, by early September 2023. More importantly, there is extensive drafting work going on right across the Royal Commission as we look to promote, through our final report, a more inclusive society. A society that supports the independence of people with disability and their right to live free from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Finally, while this is the Royal Commission's last substantive hearing, we will, we will hold a ceremonial closing ceremony hearing in Sydney on 15th of September 2023 in advance of delivery of our final report at the end of September. This closing ceremony will be open to the public who are encouraged to attend. Information, including location of the ceremonial closing hearing, is available on our website. Thank you again to everybody. This concludes the hearing this week, and we will adjourn at 10 a.m. on Friday, 15th of September, 2023, in Sydney for the ceremonial closing hearing. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now adjourned.